Okay, uh, welcome to all uh, speakers and discussants and chairs and public. And uh, uh, I'm very glad to introduce this uh, uh, second uh, conference of uh, the uh, Ciampi Institute together with the Department of Political and Social Science. And this is uh, the second conference that I organized with uh, uh, Mario Pianta, who will also say something uh, uh, about uh, the process and content of this uh, conference itself. Just wanted to say why we decided to focus on the issues of uh, inequalities and uh, uh, politics, and in particular this uh, second session on the issues of uh, territorial inequalities and their connections with uh, uh, political transformations. So the uh, uh, ideas that we developed with Mario for both of these conferences to see extent increasing inequalities in plural, different forms of inequalities have an impact uh, on different characteristics of politics. So the first uh, assumptions we built upon is the fact that the financial crisis, which started in 2008, uh, spiraled with uh, uh, many other crises uh, uh, of debt, uh, of uh, trade, of productivity, social and political crisis. And uh, this means that uh, the economic crisis was transferred into a political uh, challenge, and that these uh, challenges addressed uh, in different way uh, existing institu institutions. Through, in particular, a transformation of cleavages that had seemed to be uh, pacified settled uh, and that uh, re-emerged, and maybe through the re-emergence of uh, uh, new cleavages. And the first of this uh, conference in October addressed especially what once was called the class cleavage and the way in which uh, uh, the uh, politic, social, economic, political transformations have created uh, challenges in terms also uh, of the social basis for uh, different forms of uh, politics. So class basis uh, is changing for parties, identities are changes, uh, uh, changing populist and xenophobic forces are developing and uh, uh, through various forms of mobilizations on uh, also class uh, uh, issues. This conference addresses a parallel issues that we thought was uh, uh, one of the most fundamental challenges and this the uh, uh, territorial type of uh, uh, changes. So the challenges to territorial assets, actors, uh, uh, forms of divisions of uh, territorial power which had developed uh, uh, within uh, multi-level forms of uh, uh, governance. And so we want to address uh, in these two days with the help of uh, uh, several experts on the different uh, aspects of these transformations, how uh, uh, challenges have been produced and how they developed. Uh, uh, say um, below and above the nation states and how they are targeting uh, uh, different uh, uh, territorial level through the re-emergence uh, uh, of uh, some of uh, the uh, conflicts between center and periphery that had looked like uh, having been settled in, uh, in uh, previous times. So the crisis can be seen as a critical juncture is a moment of uh, abrupt, open-ended transformations that probably will have also path-dependent type of uh, consequences. And what we want to look at is uh, also the ways in which they are transforming territorial type of uh, identities. In a very interesting book, of uh, some time ago, Mark Basing uh, had reflected on uh, the role of uh, uh, intense time uh, in the transformations of national type of identities. He was thinking about uh, the breakdown of the Soviet Union and he distinguished nationalism in quiet time and nationalism in intense time. He was thinking about 
uh, violent type of development and uh, violent types of events, but for sure also this crisis uh, have produced intense time in which also territorial identifications have not only increases and decreases in degrees, but also have transformed their meanings. And uh, for me in particular, when I started to think about uh, a conference on the issues of inequalities uh, and uh, territorial type of conflicts, some previous research in which we had met unexpectedly this uh, uh, development of territorial conflicts were at the basis of uh, um, my need for some more focused research. Uh, one of these projects is a project I'm going to present tomorrow, uh, uh, but I think it's relevant in uh, uh, the ways in which this conference has been thought, planned, and organized. And it is uh, a project that we have done on the strange, unexpected reemergence uh, of ethno-nationalist movement or minority nationalism in areas of the world, and in particular in uh, uh, European uh, countries, uh, in which these conflicts reemerged, strangely enough, also in cases in which nationalism, uh, uh, minority nationalism, has been had been more moderate. Uh, and uh, uh, also in claims and more inclusive in uh, frames. So issues of um, uh, the nationalist uh, uh, referendums that we called referendums from below in Scotland or in Catalonia were something that we didn't expect to find as results of the crisis, but we met while studying other movements and we thought we they deserved some specific um, uh, attention. Second uh, uh, research project in which we unexpectedly found the nations was among our very cosmopolitan social movements that were in the past claiming uh, uh, and uh, calling for another uh, Europe, and that suddenly started to use national flags. So it was the anti-austerity protest uh, in uh, 2011, but even before in Iceland, they were not framed usually in uh, uh, exclusive uh, forms of uh, uh, nationalism, but they showed that there was a re-emergence of a debate about issues of national sovereignty as linked also with issues of people's sovereignty. Uh, third type of research in which this is also embedded is a research uh, always uh, going on at Cosmos on re Europeanization and social movements. And what we found was uh, an unexpected uneasiness of even progressive and inclusive movements to discuss uh, issues of Europeanizations, considering Europe as uh, too divisive. A, a, a topic and the European Union as a, a, as a difficult target to uh, address. So these movements that had been in the past claiming for another Europe were now um, more and more uneasy with talking and are still more uneasy with, uh, about talking uh, uh, on Europe and uh, they were uh, uh, rediscussing issues of, uh, again, uh, uh, national and other territorial identifications. This is on, let's say, the um, inclusive dimension of territorial uh, uh, identities, but we also met cases of exclusive territorial uh, uh, identifications. Uh, in other, for instance, two pieces of research, one is a, a research on uh, when movements for democratization fails, in which we address the case of the former Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, looked at the specific emergence of uh, uh, entrepreneurs of uh, exclusive nationalism in case of crisis, and in cases in which also economic resentment were uh, uh, say channeled through the development or redevelopment of nationalist exclusive type of identities. And finally, 
another research we were doing was on uh, uh, movements in solidarities with refugees, but also those uh, reacting uh, to uh, uh, xenophobic trends during uh, the so-called long summer of migration. And also there what we saw was the re-emergence of uh, ethnic identities, the transformations of many actors uh, into um, the transformations of many conflicts from social to uh, uh, sort of uh, ethnic definitions. So this is, uh, for me, the background from which this uh, conference emerged and uh, need uh, uh, and an attempt uh, to try to address uh, more systematically some uh, uh, questions like uh, uh, where with the nation state and Europe, uh, questions that will become quite central even for the movements that don't want to address it with the uh, forthcoming European elections. Questions about uh, when and how inclusive and exclusive forms of territorial identifications developed. Questions of how different cleavages are combined, uh, uh, when a different type of uh, resentment or grievances are expressed. And again, then, uh, questions of uh, uh, social basis of different type of movements, including uh, the territorial one, the interactions between uh, uh, minority ethno-nationalist actors with different persuasions. And uh, uh, so substantially going back to the uh, first questions uh, I had mentioned, the role of inequalities within and across regions in this transformation transformations of conflicts, uh, uh, among others, but also very centrally of territorial uh, conflicts. So this is the way of uh, presentation. Uh, uh, I presented especially my own take on the issues, and um, Mario, who has played a very pivotal entrepreneurial role in the developing of this uh, conference, presented some also complements, important complements to this uh, type of questions, and I give him the floor. Thank you, Donatella. Thank you to all the speakers and participants to this conference, uh, which uh, has been a, a challenging effort and an important exercise at interdisciplinary work, because uh, we have been uh, having lots of uh, uh, a conference about inequality among economists or about uh, nationalism among political scientists. And the, the challenge here is also to uh, exchange, uh, uh, open up a dialogue and share different concepts and agree on what are the processes, both conceptually and uh, empirically, that uh, we see. Uh, in our previous conference, the idea was to understand how uh, the long, uh, the last 30 years of, uh, of uh, economic development characterized by neoliberal policies and the stagnation in uh, uh, many European countries have been leading to this uh, unprecedented ri rise in economic inequalities associated to a much more uh, nuanced and complicated set of social inequalities, including gender, ethnic, age, and, and other differences. And of course, today, we look at the same dynamics on the in the spatial dimension, looking at the territory, how territories have been affected by these different dynamics. The crisis in the last 10 years, especially in Southern Europe, has, has marked an acceleration of these dynamics and the, um, basically the end of uh, uh, the reduction of inequalities at the end of the 70s is, has been paralleled by the end of a convergence among European regions, as uh, Francesco Asso will tell us uh, uh, later, among European regions uh, as a whole. So we, are, uh, we have been for in a long period of divergence, which has become more striking, more urgent, more dramatic in the last 10 years where there has been a major collapse of uh, uh, living standards and the incomes in many countries. Uh, in the previous conference on where we focused on the economic and social dimension and on the political consequences of this, we ha heard stories from uh, Italy, Sweden, um, 
other European countries and Latin America, uh, documenting the extent of the impoverishment of the poor, of the enrichment uh, through financial mechanism, in particular of the highest uh, in, uh, income deciles in our countries, and of the uh, social uh, breakup that has been associated to these dynamics. In all these processes, there is a combination of economic dynamics and policy and politics, because we have been uh, seeing the importance that uh, policies of redistribution through taxation, uh, welfare policies, uh, income guarantees, and so on, uh, and, and the provision of public services outside the market, we have seen, and all international data from on inequality confirms this, that uh, the, without the existing welfare arrangements and the existing uh, uh, weakened but still existing uh, redistribution policies, the inegalitarian outcomes would have been devastating. So what, what we have been seeing in most countries is a huge increase in uh, market income inequalities, the incomes that uh, we get uh, before taxes, but uh, the tax in spite of the reduced progressivity of taxation, in spite of pro-rich uh, fiscal reforms, and in spite of pri privatization, the post-tax, post-welfare, post-redistribution inequality is much smaller in all countries. Italy is <laughs> the weakest, even the UK is more, unequal, is more equal than Italy when we take into consideration this redistribution. Uh, so we have uh, interesting pictures uh, where the role of politics and policy making uh, is still crucial for uh, uh, the shaping the uh, actual outcomes. Clearly, uh, politics and, uh, this type of political process has been weakened and uh, um, uh, new challenges are emerging when uh, the losers are looking for political representation or forms of process protest and mobilization in novel ways, so, uh, including the uh, emergence of populism and uh, different types of uh, uh, political forces uh, interpreting this type of uh, social uh, uh, problems and, uh, um, and tensions. Uh, in to today and tomorrow, we focus on this territorial dimension because the same polarization that we have been monitoring in, uh, individ in terms of individual classes, social groups, professional groups, uh, can be mapped very clearly uh, on territories with, again, a, a concentration of success and power and uh, uh, income growth in areas uh, which are already uh, areas of strength in economics and social and cultural terms and a, a, a com much more complex picture of losing regions and the provinces and the cities, uh, which are both uh, the left behind from the previous wave of um, development, but also the, the, the areas of deindustrialization and new areas which are losing their high position in the hierarchy. We should always remember that uh, times of crisis are times of uh, reshuffling of the hierarchy of power in terms of economic and political power uh, e at the national and the European and, and global level. So this is an important dimension which we should pay attention to. So I think this is uh, some of the suggestions that uh, uh, may guide us in linking uh, the discussion we had last month on the uh, more economic and social aspect and the discussion of today and tomorrow on the territorial uh, dimension. Uh, we can, uh, uh, I can now become the chair of the first session, and uh, I invite the, the three speakers of uh, this afternoon, Michael Keating, Colin Crouch, uh, and Francesco Asso, to the, um, to, to the table. Thank you for... Um, Okay, I will present them in turn. Uh, this uh, first session 
provides uh, the framework also for uh, the uh, more specific analysis of this uh, of the of the of tomorrow morning that will focus more on uh, specific areas Europe Catalonia uh, Scotland and other um, uh, integration disintegration dynamics including the historical experience of uh, former Yugoslavia uh, today uh, we present with these uh, tri three papers uh, the framework for understanding Understanding the uh, rescaling of uh, the combination of economic and political processes, and uh, the uh, how we can understand the reshaping of territory, how territorial inequalities are reshaping uh, economic and political processes, and of course uh, we have to begin with. Uh, uh, Italy, which uh, of course is the most unequal country <laughs> since unification and has remained so, so where persistence of regional divides have been uh, more uh, difficult to address and have been almost forgotten as a, as a policy uh, field in, uh, in the last decades. And so, um, and it, uh, this is re-emerging as a major emergency for, uh, for uh, our countries. So that's the framework for uh, this session. I am very <clears throat> pleased to introduce to you uh, Professor Michael Keating, political scientist. He is the director of the Center for Constitutional Change at Edinburgh. He has been a professor at uh, the European University Institute and uh, Aberdeen University. Uh, an important book he wrote is uh, Rescaling the European State, with the uh, framework for understanding these uh, complex uh, in integrative and disintegrative uh, tendencies uh, um, in, uh, in the political uh, uh, arrangements. And uh, he is, uh, has been head of the, the research program on uh, constitutional implication of Brexit. And tomorrow he will do extra, an extra job as a discussant of, uh, the, in the session tomorrow, late tomorrow morning when when uh, we will discuss the case of Brexit, which has a, a specific uh, urgency in, our, in these days. Thank you, Michael. You have the floor. Well, thanks, uh, Mario. Well, when uh, Mario and Donatella asked me to say something at this conference, I took it as a... Is that working? Yeah. Uh, as an opportunity to revisit a question that has interested me in recent years. I've been working for more decades than I care to remember on regions and territorial politics, mainly looking at uh, the political side, uh, at autonomy claims and at political uh, economy, but I've become increasingly interested in the social dimension of that and territorial politics and redistributive questions. Uh, starting from uh, an ideal type of the European welfare state of the post-war era, in which questions of distributive politics, redistribution and welfare were seen as being inherently the task of the nation state. I say nation state, although that concept is itself problematical. Let's park that for a moment. On the grounds that the nation was the source of affective solidarity, therefore of sharing, that the state was bounded and therefore social partners and social groups did not have a, policy, a possibility of exit and therefore had to come to social compromises within the frontiers of the nation state. Uh, and thirdly, because the state had the administrative capacity and the resources to engage in extensive welfare policy. This, this stems from an argument so people like Charles Tilley made. The state may be founded for the purposes of war but generates surpluses that can be used for other purposes. And that, of course, is an ideal type. It was never really like that. It was always much more complex. But in recent years, we've been seeing two processes that put that in, in question in a very serious way. One is the process of spatial rescaling. There was an argument about 20 years ago about the end of territory and deterritorialization at the same time as the end of history and the end of absolutely every other social science concept we've ever heard of. Uh, history didn't go away and territory didn't go away. What was really happening was a, a rescaling of territory in that different social, political, economic systems were migrating to new spatial scales, new territorial levels and were therefore disaggregating so that the boundaries of the state were no longer coterminous with the boundaries of major social, economic and welfare systems. And this is best documented in the case of the economy. We've got the whole 
globalization debate, and let's just park that term as well because we could get into it. But, but at, at the transnational level, there are important mechanisms of, of economic change. At the local and regional level, there's now a very large literature on the importance of local factors of production there, uh, a great deal of argument about it, but certainly we cannot see the nation state any longer as the most useful unit even to measure, let alone control economic change and development. I, I go through a number, number of other functional fields. The environment quite obviously is localizing and globalizing at the same time, higher education, but there's also the field of welfare because at the same time as this process of uh, functional rescaling, we're getting a functional transformation. So that welfare policy is transitioning from the old passive policy based upon the male-headed household, the male breadwinner model towards a much more complex set of issues with new risks, new social risks, precarious employment, uh, dimensions neglected previously like gender are coming in. The whole field of welfare is becoming much more complex and there has been a general tendency to try to bring together welfare policy together with economic development policy very often through the mechanism of education and training. That policy field is an excellent example of a field that is both transforming itself functionally and rescaling territorially because it's very often at the level of territorial labor markets that these things come together. Now one could go on multiplying these functional changes ad, ad infinitum, but it creates a multi-scalar level of action. I should say at this point that I don't, do not think this process is functionally determinist. It is highly political. This is created by human beings. So uh, I'm taking uh, my, my distance here from the functional determinist, just as globalization is not something that happens, it's something that is produced uh, and, and reproduced. So it's a highly political process. But we're also getting rescaling of, of, of identities, of political communities. Political communities are being reconstructed. Old identities are being rediscovered and pressed into service for modern projects. So we no longer think of identitarian politics necessarily as the residue of the past, but a way of coping with the present. And if I'm talking about my personal experience, Scotland uh, always existed, but when it, in my childhood it was a very different place. It just meant something different and much less politicized than the current conception of, of what Scotland is. So we're getting those uh, processes that are going on. There are institutional implications for this, and, and two processes are particularly important. One is the response of states to these processes of rescaling, which is to try and rebuild systems of government and policy making and regulation corresponding to these new levels, hence the European project, hence the municipal reorganization, hence metropolitan cities, hence the emergence of this meso-intermediate level of government, Italy, Spain, many places. I was going to say the UK, but it's very partial there. In England, the repeated attempts to try and get it right, to try and get some territorial fix there that never seems to have, have worked. Uh, governments then are looking for new levels of regulation, but at the same time from the bottom, you're getting mobilizations around this, and particularly mobilizations around the mode of development, the meaning of territory, definition of territory, which is a highly contested uh, notion. So it's the combination of those bottom-up and top-down processes that produces the outcome, uh, what I regard as a move towards territorial uh, government, I don't say governance, government, because that's the only legitimate way you can resolve these policy choices. It's the only way you can work it out in a democracy it is through the, the electoral mechanism in very imperfect ways. We know the project to politicize and democratize Europe is a partial success at best, but the issue is out there. There is a debate about that. And we're seeing then a contestation over not only territorial boundaries, because of course territorial boundaries have a huge impact on who wins and who loses, but also over the meaning of territory itself. Uh, there are multiple constructions of what we mean by a region, which is the level that I've looked at uh, most often. Uh, I had an argument, I constantly have this argument with regional studies people. I, I published a paper in regional studies last year 
uh, in which they're saying, you've got to define the region first, and then you will have regionalism. And I say, no, no, regions are created by regionalism. There's no such thing as an objective region. There are different constructions. Uh, and one construction of the region, which is taken from a certain reading of the political economy of regions literature, is the, the competitive region. It's all about competitiveness. Now, that serves the interest of states and the European Commission, because basically you can say, if you're not developing, it's your fault, bluntly. Because you offload it. Uh, we, we get the European Commission saying all regions must become more competitive. Pause for a moment. It's impossible. It's a relative concept. So, because competition and competitiveness is such a strong legitimating language in this neoliberal age, then that becomes the master a recipe for that. And you get kinds of regional neo-mercantilism. We're all competing against each other for a finite pot of resources, which of course is a, is a misreading of, of this literature about local political economy. It's an instrumentalization for political purposes. But there are also the concept of the, of the, of the welfare region, the region as a space for solidarity, the region as a space for identity. There are multiple meanings of regions. So that becomes highly uh, contested, and once again, the way you resolve this is through the electoral mechanisms. We get back to old fashioned notions of, of electoral uh, democracy. Now, what are the implications of that then for social solidarity? There's a very long standing, very powerful hypothesis here, which is about the race to the bottom, uh, which it posits that if you get decentralization, uh, then you're going to get interspatial inequality because the better regions will do better and you're going to get intra-territorial inequality because regions will have to emphasize economic development in the na na narrow sense, attract footloose capital, suppress social and environmental costs in order to compete. Now, that is the mainstay of the literature in the United States on this. I was, I was, last year I was in a meeting in New York where we were discussing all these things and our American colleagues were saying, obviously, decentralization is anti-solidarity. I come from Texas and the last thing I want is for Texas to be more powerful. I said, well, if I came from Texas, I'd agree with you. But I don't, I come from Scotland and I, and I want more power at this level because it's actually more solidaristic than, than the level of uh, the state. So, this is an empirical question, not a question that can be answered by abstract theory. Yes, there may be this tendency to race to the bottom, but it's not obvious that the best way of attracting economic development is a stripped down neoliberal model of the minimal state. You need public goods to develop. You need to train the labor force, you need education, uh, and so on. So even in our economic sense, that doesn't necessarily work. Besides which, uh, when we look at European cases, we see as much evidence of a race to the top as a race to the bottom. And competitive regionalism is sometimes about competing in a race to the bottom, but it's also sometimes competing in policy innovation, competing to satisfy the demands of, of citizens. You may get a race to the top then. You may get a race to the middle. Uh, which is interesting. This is something that our friend Patrick Legales has talked about, and, and, and one of his students has done wonderful work. Because of a combination, you don't want to raise taxes too high because you'll be uncompetitive. You don't want to put them too low because you'll, you'll simply uh, miss, miss resources. So th there's this notion of, of convergence, or the other hypothesis is divergence. And all of these things can be going on at the same time. So how do we explain uh, differences? Well, I, I look then at the powers that regional governments have, fiscal capacity, it's good to have your own resources, but if you are dependent on your own resources, you'll be dependent on the market. So some kind of mixture of own resources and redistribution would be the ideal uh, thing. Uh, the competences, kinds of competences you have, combinations of competences. We're having a big debate in Scotland at the moment about uh, new powers, which is almost entirely about, I want more powers or anything. We don't want to give you everything, anything, and so there's a compromise in the middle. I'm trying to say there's a sensible uh, combination of powers there that would have a lot more decentralization of labor market policy and labor relations and uh, tie in with, with other things and not decentralizing other things. There is a combination that would allow these kinds of choices 
to be made. We, we haven't got it in Scotland, unfortunately, but that's just because of the, the, the way that politics uh, works. But there's also the policy communities, and, and I had a project on this a few years ago looking at the rescaling of policy communities, that is the representation of social and economic interests, the degree to which they are refracted by a different territorial context. So the political agenda is changed. We looked at capital, we looked at labor, we looked at environment as, as a representative uh, social movement, and, and we looked at, at farmers, and we saw that both capital and labor rescaling their modes of representation in complex ways, big difference between large business and small businesses, trade unions conflicted because they're interested in playing the regional game, because they're involved in uh, struggles against plant closures very often, which are essentially territorial and become the basis of broader territorial struggles. They like the national welfare state. They like to regional government because very often they've been excluded in recent years from national level corporatist arrangements or influence. They're seeking influence at new levels. It's a complex story there. So we get a different balance of power then and, and, and different relations amongst the various groups. We get sometimes, sometimes a kind of social compromises reached at the le regional level. The region is a loosely bounded space, so you can't get regional corporatism. It's not going to happen. But different forms of social consultation are taking place uh, at the regional level. Now, we, we looked at the United Kingdom. I say we because it's just myself and my assistants. We're doing the whole lot because we're trying to keep uh, the same perspective. We did uh, studies in Italy, Spain, France, Germany, and Belgium and the United Kingdom. And again, a huge diversity within those countries as well as uh, between those countries. What are the implications of that? Uh, I said I'd really like to do another study looking at the implications for policy of all of this. Does all of this make any difference? And the European Research Council said, ah, uh, that's just not an interesting question. Yeah. And that's what they said. Um, there's, there's nothing there. Anyway, there's a literature on multi-level governance, so just go away. Uh, so that's, that's when I abandoned it, and along came Brexit and the Scottish referendum, and I got occupied in other things until I was invited to another project in Wales with Anwen over there, uh, and, and trying to re revisit it. Well, what do we know? There, there, there are important differences. One difference is the choice of social groups that you favour. One place it's young people, one place it's old people. And this is what I was trying to tell the European Research Council. Don't look at it functionally. Look at it client group basis. Which groups are favored? That's to do with the local politics, the construction of power uh, locally. Uh, it's unemployed, it's, it's whatever, it's, it's different groups. This has huge distributional consequences. Uh, all the regions talk about socially inclusive, sustainable development, but that doesn't mean anything. The interesting thing is the trade-offs, of course, that I made there. Uh, big differences in public service delivery, huge differences between the traditional state-based model and the contracting model, the new public management and so on. Some of this is to do with long stay in Spain. It's because there is a tradition of that in many places to do with the role of the church and other groups. Others, it's, it's new public management. It's new in Valencia, for example. It's new in Catalonia. It was, it was old. Uh, that's a big difference. That's not just about efficiency. That is about, that has distributional consequences, how you deliver these services. Uh, differences in universalism versus selectivism, where, where there's a possibility of universalism versus selectivism, uh, and uh, differences in taxation policy. Now, regions have relatively mar small margins for differential taxation, except for Scotland, which has a huge amount these days. Uh, but in Spain, wh where they, when they brought it in, initially populists cut the taxes, cut inheritance taxes, which for some reason I've never understood is a very popular policy because most people lose in cutting it then. But it, it seems to be popular. And then with the crisis, much more selectivity, much more change, and much more thinking about uh, fiscal policy. So yes, there's a variation. Uh, now, how we classify these as more progressive or less progressive, more egalitarian or not, not less egalitarian, that's a difficult question because we know the old debate between selectivity and universalism. 
it's not, it's not at all. So I'm not making any claims about equality, but I would like to do that at some point and, and see which of these policies is actually promoting social cohesion and, and redistribution. So it is the fact that Scottish universities students don't pay fees, nor do Italian students in Scotland, by the way, but, but English students do, uh, including in Scotland, uh, that benefits wealthy families because they send their children to university. So you could say it's regressive. On the other hand, as an intergenerational distribution mechanism, it looks pretty good because the, the, the young people are the ones who are losing out everywhere. And this is a policy that seems to favor young people. So I, 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 in the paper, I don't get into those normative questions. I'm just saying I'm mapping it. There is a big difference there. Distributive politics is really important. Uh, there's no r general rule about a race to the bottom or the race to the top, but a huge amount of differentiation. Excellent, uh, Michael. Thank you very much for this uh, presentation of uh, what uh, uh, complex territory we face in uh, reinvestigating the changes uh, in the uh, territorial dimension of uh, uh, policies. We, it's now the turn of uh, Colin Crouch uh, talking about uh, territorial inequalities in post-industrial economies. He has a PowerPoint, so we can... Uh, uh, um, Professor Colin Crouch is well known to most of you, um, has, is a very important uh, uh, economic sociologist and political sociologist, has been teaching at Oxford, the European University Institute, and Warwick. Uh, among his uh, many books, uh, I would like to remind you of uh, Post-Democracy and uh, the forthcoming follow-up to that, and uh, The Strange Non-Death of Neoliberalism, both of which are quite relevant for our discussion. And uh, <clears throat> uh, he will talk about territorial inequalities in post-industrial economies. And uh, um, Colin, you have the floor. Thank you. It's on. Yeah. Uh, this paper is largely a failure. Um, I wanted to follow up some of the themes that Mario was talking about at the beginning. Uh, and also some of the things that came up in Michael's talk. Because we know that w with the passing away of industrial society and the development of post-industrial work of various kinds, uh, society is changing. Uh, the geographical distribution of important activities is changing. Post the geography of post-industrial societies looks different from that of industrial societies. And we know that this has implications for the kind of people that, that exist. Uh, educational levels are different in different kinds of sector. Gender balances are different. Age balances are different. So uh, as we make post-industrial society, we actually make a new people, and we've been doing this now for quite a long time, several decades in most countries. And the, these, both within and across countries, these new structures of populations uh, uh, have different geographical clusters. And one of the strange facts about post-industrial society it is that it, key economic activities are much more concentrated than people thought they would be. I mean, it's fairly obvious that many industrial activities have to have certain geographical locations. And so it was believed that event the rise of post-industrial societies would mean you would get a far more even distribution of activities. Things could choose where they wanted to go more. Therefore, it was concluded they will go all over. Um, this is true for some activities, of course, um, certain, especially certain public services like health and education, social care, do tend to be distributed according to where the population is. Uh, if it wasn't for those activities, some areas would have almost no skilled, highly educated people at all. So the, the role of, of the, the key services of the welfare state, whether they're privatized or not, has quite a role in, 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 reduce, in restricting the range of inequalities uh, across countries. But many other activities 
concentrate very heavily. The fact that these things can go where they like and don't have particularly strong space needs means they tend to cluster. They cluster in capital cities, they cluster in the most beautiful cities, they cluster in the cities most easily uh, connected by transport. And, and this is particularly true of uh, anything related to the financial, to financial services, which is the sector that is most clearly driving high levels of inequality uh, around the world. If you, if you go to any city and you want to answer the question, and, and visit it physically, get out at the railway station, and you want to answer the question, does this city have a financial district, and if so, where is it? You can answer that very quickly by just looking around where there are enormous concentrations of extremely high buildings. That's the financial sector. They all want to be near each other because they share a lot of services and they're constantly changing jobs in, 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 among each other. Uh, and they, 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 they don't have many space needs, so they just go up. Uh, the journey to work of their staff gets worse and worse. The, the cities get more and more congested. No one can afford to live there. Uh, but the financial district is very clear uh, uh, on the skyline. That's the, ext the extreme case, but there are others. So there is clearly a geography, uh, an economic geography, uh, and a, uh, uh, of post-industrial society <coughs> that is, is being studied, right? But I think we still, still don't know enough about it. And then there is the question, which everybody's interested at the moment, does the, this new distribution of uh, places and people uh, have much to do with the rise of far-right parties and, and xenophobic populist movements? Because there's a, a, there's a very strong rhetoric that vote for these parties and movements is the vote from those left behind. Uh, and being left behind could well have an important economic geographical meaning. Those people, uh, and we know, and I'll show you some graphs in a minute, we know that voting for these parties is geographically concentrated. They're not, they're not evenly distributed around societies. And it, what is the connection between these changes in where economic activities of different kinds are taking place, with their characteristically different workforces, different educational levels, different gender balances. What's the connection between those and where these movements are to be found? And I was hoping to provide some answers to that, and I failed. Uh, you can get the data. Uh, most of the data you want is published. Um, the problem is that Data about earnings, education level, uh, kinds of structure of local economies, uh, level of income in different places. That, that's all available on, from Eurostat on nuts levels, various ranges of regions. Political data are available according to voting districts. And you have, these don't aggregate up together very well. You, you eventually find, you, you, if you go up and up higher levels of population coverage, you get to something like the regions of large countries, then you, you usually can match up political and, eco, and economic geographical data. But this is a pretty useless level. I've, I'm going to show you some numbers, because since all I could find was these things, I'm not going to waste them. Uh, but these are really two... The, these are too broad a level of aggregation. If you really want to know where certain activities are concentrated, what, what educational level different places have, and how that relates, you really need uh, how that relates to political data. You need to build up from a much lower base. So this is, I'm just suggesting this is a research project someone might like to do. Uh, if I live long enough, I might do it myself. But uh, at my age, that's optimistic. Um, so. Starting off, um, this, we, we, as, as, as these are points I've already made largely, um, that, that we know there's in increasing inequalities within societies, a lot of which has to do with the financialization of the economy and the location of activities related to finance. And then there, uh, oh, can we make it bigger? Oh, good. Ah, 
No. Yes. Hey, Mr. Malia? No, no, it's not better, is it? Is it better? How can I get rid of this? Eh? Well, is it? Oh, oh, it's ah. It looks different on here. All right. Yeah, that's much. That's much better. Yeah, that's what I want you to have. Yes. Um, and uh, that summarizes the points I've been making. I should have put this up further. Um, uh, so uh, it seems likely that a new cultural politics is being produced with this territorial component, but we don't really know what it is. Uh, and in, what we're increasingly having are culture wars. It's a concept the Americans have used for quite a while. We're starting to have to use it in Europe too. Uh, culture wars they, being that are superimposed on the old class conflicts. And there's a lot of terms people use about to try and define these things. We talk about xenophobia, we talk about populism. It struck me about three days ago, no, last week, that actually a concept that unites a lot of these things, and which relates quite easily then to the geographical issue, is nostalgia. Uh, the, the, the notion of being left behind is a kind of nostalgia for a world that people feel was better. Uh, it, that their societies were more ethnically homogenous, their countries seemed to be more independent, didn't seem to need anybody else. Men were men and women were women uh, and accepted that. Uh, and well, there also there was less tolerance of sexual diversity. Um, people, uh, there was a, perhaps an industrial world as well. Uh, and this is passing. Now, nostalgia in itself is just a sort of quiet emotion that people feel. When, in, when nostalgia is politicized, it becomes something very different. Politicized nostalgia is a very defensive thing. It says, my world is going away. I'm going to defend what's left of it. And I'm going to resist people who are invading my world. Right? I'm going to resist immigrants. I'm going to resist women. I'm going to resist. The, so it, it's a defensive Narrow, a narrow defensiveness of a world that's felt to be threatened and can actually become violent. Uh, the actual defensiveness can be literal defensiveness. And I think, in a way, nostalgia, partly as a, as a widely felt emotion that one can understand and have empathy for, and then one can understand how it might become politicized. And this, if we're going to try and study, in a way I hoped I could, but I can't, uh, but to try and study try and study relations between geographical economic change um, and nostalgia, uh, then I think we might make progress. It prevents us, for example, from talking only about uh, declining industrial areas. Uh, because if you look at things like the vote for Donald Trump or the vote for Brexit in Britain, you can't explain that by people living in declining industrial areas. These people are very few in number. Uh, they need the support of a lot of other people who feel the same way as they do, who might be very prosperous people, very wealthy, living in quiet, beautiful places, but who feel the world is passing them by. Right? They might still have their money, but somehow the action is somewhere else. So they're resentful of the changes they see. So I think it's, I'm going to use votes for various populist, right-wing populist movements as the indicator I'm using, but I think we need to get a richer understanding of the diversity of that. It's not a simple thing. Uh, and so these wars have a, a complex territorial dimension. There is a territorial dimension, and this is a, this is the the these maps, these geographical maps of elections are extremely misleading uh, because they uh, what they show, this is the French presidential election, the first round when there were four candidates, um, five candidates. Um, they show you which candidate was ahead in each of the, the districts that's being used there, uh, each of the departments. Um, but that doesn't show you how far ahead they were. It doesn't show you whether they, when there's five candidates, did they actually have a majority or just a plurality, and, and how close was it? So you, you really can't use these things to say very much. All you can say is there was 
a kind of geography to that. Because the, the gray, or gray-blue, whatever that color is, <laughs> um, it, is where uh, Marine Le Pen got her vote, and the yellow is where Macron got his vote, and then uh, Fillon was the blue, and, and Mélenchon the, the red. Uh, and it's interesting how the vote for Front National was concentrated in its old heartland in the south, um, in, in the southeast, but also a large part of northeastern France, with the exception of Paris. Paris is the empty whites uh, area, and up in the top corner, you, uh, top left corner, uh, you see the breakdown in, in the, the, the Paris region, the Ile de France. Um, at the, to the top right, you have the diagram that represents the voting in the final round of the, the previous elections, 2012. You see a similar geography between the left and the right, but not the same. So there's a geography there, right? Uh, that's all you can say. Uh, it's interesting, it, it, a simple theory of left behind regions won't work because a region that's really left behind usually in, in, um, uh, in France is, is Brittany and other parts of the, the South uh, West, but they, they, they voted for Macron. They didn't, if, 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 if Front National represented the left behind, then it wasn't there. Now, uh, even more distorted is uh, Sweden. Uh, now, there are two, I, I couldn't get rid of one of these diagrams because I don't have the technical skill. Uh, they, they show the same election. One actually is showing boundaries of larger units than the other one. The one on the right shows you the smaller electoral units and so is therefore somewhat more accurate. Uh, this has the same problem that the French one had. It only shows you which party was ahead in each district. Uh, but there's a, uh, it doesn't show you the closeness of the vote, but there's an extra distortion in the Swedish case, and that is most of northern Sweden is empty. And about not many people live there. They might vote for the Social Democrats, but there's only about six or seven of them. Uh, so the, the red was the vote for the Social Democrats, blue for the bourgeois parties, yellow for the Sweden Democrats, the former Nazi party, and white are, are rather large lakes. Um, and what this, uh, although it, it, it's very, very distorted, but it, what it does show is the extraordinary geographical concentration of the main points of Swedish Democrat, uh, Sweden Democrat strength in the region of Skåne in southern Sweden, which is not a left behind region at all. It includes the city of Malmö, which is a, a, an industrial city under some stress, but actually the Social Democrats did quite well in Malmö itself. So, but Skåne. It was the area where uh, the far right concentrated its vote. Um, it's the area where the old uh, founder of Ikea comes from. He was a Nazi uh, in his time. Uh, the United States is a very familiar map. This is, again, the same distortion. Because uh, here, remember, in the United States, red is the right and blue is the left, um, or if the Democrats are the left. Um, this shows that what's becoming an interesting characteristic of the United States, a kind of salt water versus fresh water difference in that the democratic vote tends to be, though not absolutely, concentrated on in states with seaboards um, and the Republicans hold the middle. Um, now, this is the Italian election of earlier this year. Uh, blue is uh, La Lega, yellow is uh, Movimento Cinque Stelle, and red is the uh, Democrat Democratici. Uh, now, this again, the same distortion. It, on, it only shows you who was ahead, but there's a second distortion there, and that is uh, the, the, the distortion of how the vote for the two so-called populist parties was distributed. Uh, and you, you try and explain that you need to remember that people in the South know that the Lega used to be the Lega Nord. And until they discovered Muslims, the people they hated was the people in the South. So they remember that in Southern Italy, uh, and they didn't vote for the Lega. They voted for Movimento Cinque Stelle instead. And now what, why, and what, what were they expressing? Were people saying the same thing when they voted for these two parties? It's difficult to say. What it does show us is 
the complication of these geographies uh, and the, the, diff the di very diverse meaning that these different parties can have. Um, something else that we all, this, this is where I wanted to get these more local <coughs> data because we know there is something about big, rather successful cities that is different from the rest of the country. We know that uh, in several cases, large cities have been resisting um, the rise of xenophobic populist parties more than other parts of the country. In, in, the, uh, in the Austrian gen elections, where there was this big shift towards uh, the, the uh, uh, Freiheitliche Partei, who are a kind of ex-Nazi party, really, and the reinvented Volkspartei, who had reinvented themselves as an anti-Islamic party against the, the Socialist Party, which was in decline. Um, in Vienna, Salzburg, and Graz, the three most important cities in the country, the political move was in exactly the opposite direction. It was towards the SPO. Uh, in Budapest, also resisted the strengthening of uh, Fidesz's, uh, Fidesz's uh, successful vote earlier this year. Uh, so there's, it's interesting, big cities are where the immigrants are concentrated, they're where life is often quite hard, uh, but these are the places most resisting uh, xenophobic populism. And I've got some more detailed data on uh, the British Brexit election. Um, this mainly reveals my lack of graphical skills, because it's not so easy to follow. What I've set out there, and they're marked in red, are the different regions of the country, showing beside the name of the region the percentage of the population in that region that voted for Brexit, that voted to leave the European Union. Uh, I've also put in every time the UK average, so you can compare a region with the, that's in blue. In black are the 30 largest cities in the country. And you'll see that with the exception of six of them, these all voted less to leave the European Union than the, the average of the region. The largest cities, and London, you can't really judge it, because London is London is London. So, it, 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 and it was the area in England that had the lowest vote for Brexit. But even in, in say, in the Northwest, a, a, a region that voted fairly strongly uh, for Brexit, Liverpool and Manchester, the great cities of the region, voted, uh, voted a majority to stay in the European Union. Um, I've just been told I've got three minutes left. This is going to be a problem. Um, but it's so actually, I shall I better zip through. Uh, interesting, along the bottom, you see the three non-English parts of Britain. Wales did vote a majority for Brexit. Uh, Scotland and Northern Ireland didn't. And there are interesting complexities within that. Uh, within Wales, the two big cities, so it's voted less for Brexit than the Wales overall. But also, uh, within Wales, the Welsh-speaking districts, which you might think are the most left behind of all, uh, most at odds with the modern world, did not vote strongly for Brexit. In Northern Ireland, the Catholics voted heavily to stay in Europe. The Protestants voted by a smaller majority to leave the European Union. There are cultural issues here. Uh, and you, UK, it, 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 Scotland, Northern Ireland, and, and Wales, you could see as left behind marginal regions of Britain. But that's, in that case, that's not, that doesn't explain Brexit voting. Um, I better whiz on here. I, there's an interesting correlation in Britain between, it, again, I've had to get to this level of the region, which is far too, it's, it's far too aggregated, but it does show something. There is quite a strong correlation between the proportion of a population in a region with tertiary education and Brexit voting, very a strong negative connection. The two clearly exceptional areas who, given their, low, their level of education, should have voted much more strongly for Brexit are Northern Ireland and Scotland again. Uh, I'll have to not, I've got a load of other stuff on Germany that um, 
really doesn't demonstrate much at all. It demonstrates how things you might think explain the rise of the IF day don't seem to explain it. Um, what we have clearly is a complexity. Uh, we have more than one variable. The notion of left behind economically uh, is not the same as of, of feelings of being out of step culturally uh, or of feeling you're not part of a modern world. And so to, to link the economic geography of places and where that's taking them will clearly have some relation to these variables, but not totally. And that, that strong showing there for the role of higher education in the Brexit vote is not at all reproduced in Germany, where voting for the IF day has absolutely no relation at all to, to region, to, to lend, different lender. Well, I've got to stop there. So that's it. How do I get rid of my things? Oh. Thank you very much, uh, Colin. Um, mapping is a very important exercise in this, uh, in this uh, perspective because it allows us to understand the complexity of the geography of uh, economic and social and political change. And uh, um, it is true that these, but also our the topics of last uh, conferences are more research projects than uh, actual research results. We move now to <clears throat> the Italian story. Uh, Pier Francesco Asso is a professor of, at the University of Palermo, professor of economic history, has worked on uh, Italian economic history, the finance history, banking history, and uh, especially in the 20th century, and um, has been very active in uh, understanding also this uh, north-south uh, dimension, and uh, we learn from him this, uh, the good news and the bad news in this <laughs> regard. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Mario, and thank you, Donatella, for your kind invitation to this conference. And, uh, well, <clears throat> there are several studies uh, by economic historians on uh, regional inequalities in Europe, some recent studies, and as it has been said before, they show how uh, using a long-term perspective how uh, inequalities, how the process of convergence uh, stopped in, by the early 1980s and uh, ever since that date inequalities increased and dramatically increased, particularly in this first part of the 21st century. Now in these studies uh, Italy is, of course, mentioned as the country where uh, regional inequalities has been, have been more uh, persistent, more substantial, have such a long history. And uh, new findings on north-south disparities uh, not only focus on, of course, on the economic sphere, on per capita income, but involve many social and economic dimensions that never, uh, more or less give, give the same picture. And this is the picture uh, that opens up this book on, uh, on the history of regional inequalities in Europe uh, in the chapter regarding Italy the north-south divide. Uh, as you can see, it starts with the unification of the country when there was a very strong convergence that all regions were uh, at about the same level of poverty, so to speak. And, uh, but at, at that time, there were several southern regions where uh, income per capita was higher uh, according to the most recent estimates than other regions in the country. And then divergences uh, opened up in the 20th century. Then the, there is the glorious 30 years in the post-war years where, uh, and that for a number of reasons, politics included, uh, the South grew more than uh, the rest of the country, and the country was experimenting the so-called Italian miracle, and then again, the 1980s, as we said, is a kind of a watershed, and disparities dramatically increased in the new century. 
quite unexpectedly, because the South is a much more sheltered economy, much more protected economy, the share of the market economy is in the South is lower, but the financial uh, exposure of the South is lower, the degree of trade openness of the South, of Southern regions is lower than the rest of the country, but nevertheless, the South collapsed. And uh, it collapsed in comparison with uh, the other macro areas. It, com it collapsed in comparison with the average European Union uh, performance. And data could be provided in, uh, uh, under many perspectives. I just here recall uh, that in terms of physical capital and in terms of human capital, it started a so-called vicious circle uh, that involves both the economic sphere and the, de the demographic sphere, which is really hard to reverse. And it is really dramatic because uh, the, there is a net loss of population. There, is, there are dramatic figures of high quality migration uh, that, uh, of young people leaving the South uh, after the degree now, after high school, uh, and the, the most re renowned research institute in the country, Vimets, talks about the des desertification of the South. Now, having said this, what new perspectives can we add to this picture? Uh, it is maybe sound a little bit ambitious, but uh, I just want to stress the importance that uh, the, the research, the a group of people around the Fundazione Res in the last few years has done, and the, I will show you some results in, in, in this afternoon, is an attempt to focus on within South inequalities and, and to see whether we can uh, learn some lectures from the extreme polarization that characterizes the southern economy and society as well, and uh, the great heterogeneity that, that characterizes the southern economy. And I do so trying to follow two different approaches. First, to show you some aggregate indicators at a very local level, like uh, local labor systems at the level of provinces, not comparing regions, but comparing uh, provinces or local labor systems. Then I will show you some results from a number of surveys that we, uh, uh, we've been able to lead uh, in, and to conduct on firm strategies in the uh, number of years that go from 2009 until 2013. Every year we conduct a survey involving not only southern firms but also northern firms in comparisons. A uh, few words about the first point, the aggregates. Uh, I built up aggregates at a provincial level regarding different measures of productivity, one of these uh, being able to, uh, to, 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 to use a huge number of data from, from individual firms, uh, exports, infrastructures, patents, uh, propensity to innovate, agglomerations, uh, and then also uh, social capital, human capital institutions. Uh, I won't show you much of this, I refer to the paper, but we, uh, the, the image that we get from these uh, exercises is quite standard, uh, with really minor variations. We have low levels of everything regarding the South, and extremely high variability compared to the other areas. Uh, I'll just show you exports and innovations because this is where I will say something about the firms. On the left hand side you see levels and levels at, uh, at, uh, at uh, provincial per capita of exports you see the northeast stands out uh, five times as much as the average southern province. But on the right hand side is, I think, the most interesting part, is the extreme variability of southern provinces. This means that there are provinces that are parts of the south that 
so to speak, behave or perform at a very similar level to the rest of the countries, and that there are parts of the South that are extremely far away from uh, doing this and from the rest of the country. This uh, double image, such uh, striking differences in terms of level and in terms of variability, is, as I said before, the same under all the dimensions that I've meant. This is patents, for instance. Um, again, the Northeast stands out with more than 120 patents uh, per million of, of inhabitants per year in these 10 years. Uh, the center is far away. The center is sometimes closer to the south and sometimes closer to the, to the north. But the center, if you leave Siena, Pisa, and Ancona out of this picture, is, uh, is more similar to the south. And the south has a level of uh, uh, patents produced very low. Again, in terms of variability, you have cities in the south that are quite competitive and uh, can match the, the performance of northern cities, but the variability is extremely high. The only, uh, the only exception to this is uh, when we estimate social capital in terms of strong and formal ties, that means in terms of the, the networks of relations that are built uh, according to uh, parental ties, to friends, friendship, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, it is the South that stands out in terms of levels, and it is the South that has the lower variability compared to. But this is the only exception, because uh, other estimates of social capital bring the picture back to the former image. Now, let me give you some results in terms of field studies. I skip, of course, all the methodological issues, but I just want you to know that what you will see is, is focused on those sectors and those firms where the South has some strong comparative advantages, because that's where uh, uh, possibilities of endogenous growth should come, and do come, actually. Uh, what it happens is that the winning strategies of these firms when they, when they, when they perform uh, well in terms of uh, growth, of turnover, of employment, of uh, export markets, in those terrible years that went between 2009 and 2014, the winning strategies are quite the same as the rest of the country, as the rest of the world. Innovation, exports, valorization of high quality assets, nothing much under the southern sun, we could add. Uh, and these are the firms that record higher results, better results in terms of performance. And uh, this is just an image that shows you how exporting firms behaved uh, in terms of growth of turnover and capacity to innovate compared to non-exporters. And we also had uh, some firms that are potentially exporters. I will come to those at the very end. And as you see, that there is a strong connection between exports and innovation, as is uh, often mentioned in the literature. And uh, those uh, firms that, that uh, uh, are innovative in foreign markets uh, always increased year after year their export capacity and their capacity to conquer new markets. Uh, but this is just uh, an image that gives the results of these strategies, which are the same strategies that most firms adopted to uh, survive the financial crisis and, uh, and the difficult times uh, of those years. Uh, we can ask, what are the drivers in the South that uh, allow these firms to reach these results? Uh, the two main drivers that come from our research are the propensity to, in, to cooperate, to establish relations, to find new forms of integration with other areas that could provide those goods in terms of services, in terms of, of public goods that were mentioned also before, uh, that the environment of the South does not possess, and the capacity to attract human capital. And these are the discriminating factors uh, that, of course, are higher 
uh, in exporting firms and innovative firms. Let me say something about cooperation because uh, uh, I, I think this is quite interesting in terms of territorial differences. We were we asked how often do southern firms cooperate with comparison to northern firms in these specific sectors which are, so to speak, the sectors of the south, but also of Emilia-Romagna or Veneto, agro-industry, tourism, etc. We found that th there is the same quantities of cooperation. So from a quantitative point of view, there is not much of a difference between the North and the South. But we found that in the South, the quality of cooperation is much worse in the sense that corporations are more spot, are less extended, do not involve many uh, aspects of the firm's activity. Uh, like in the north, where they are more stable, they involve cooperation not only in marketing, but also in research and development in other areas of, uh, uh, of a firm's activity. Then we asked, can we kind of measure the returns of cooperation? Can we see what are the differences between cooperative firms and non-cooperative firms? So the, 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 the results are that uh, uh, cooperation pays a dividend in the sense that if we compare cooperative co with non-cooperative firms, uh, the, um, the results are quite striking and are shown in this graph. On the top side are strategies like innovation, research and development, and export capacity. The green is the number of cooperative firms. The red is the number of non-cooperative firms. On the lower side are budget indicators like uh, value added, return on investments, and other indicators that ha have been taken from the reports of the firm. So we see that both in the north and in the south, there is a difference that goes on behalf of uh, cooperative firms. But what is more striking is that in the south, the relative returns of cooperation are higher. So the difference between cooperative and non-cooperative firms in the south are much higher than in the north. This could mean that in an environment where doing business is much more difficult, where there is a shortage of collective goods, of collective services, uh, cooperation adds value in the north, but not as much as it does add value in the south, where there is a shortage of many uh, institutional things that uh, help uh, business activity. So the relative returns of cooperation are higher. In this case, the red bars are south and the green bars are north, northern firms, are higher in the south than in the north. One final, one final picture uh, regards only southern firms. We try to distinguish firms that cooperate with the external subjects, uh, with other firms or other subjects that operate in other sectors or in other territories, and on the other hand, cooperative firms that only cooperate with uh, parents, friends, acquaintances, strong ties. And here is the result. The returns of cooperation are much higher with new partners, with informal partners, so to speak, than with partners with which we have strong ties and we cooperate only because uh, uh, there are uh, maybe, sorry? Uh. <clears throat> And so this is uh, some insights from this uh, analysis of the cooperative networks. And uh, uh, we see that, for instance, the demand from, for cooperation in the South is so uh, strong, in a sense, that network contracts uh, that were introduced in the Italian legislation in 2009 to support some specific forms of re business relation and cooperation without losing uh, individual firms' autonomy, governance, uh, ownership, family structure, but putting together firms just for the specific achievement of the contract. Uh, these forms of contracts 
Uh, in the first five years, north, north firms and southern firms were about at the same level. But today, these are data from June 2018, you see that southern firms are numbered in terms of contract north in, in northern firms. And these 7,000 contracts involve something like 50,000 firms that have established contracts with many other firms, particularly market service firms in the north, since in the south, uh, the, 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 the presence of urban areas uh, offering services for firm is really low and really something missing. Again, also in this matter, institutional, in these uh, aspects of co network contracts, institutional quality matters, we saw that Puglia and Sicily, two big regions that are often at the political, at the extreme of, of the political and economic spectrum in terms of uh, history, in terms of uh, many other things, have achieved very differ different results. Uh, Puglia, uh, both local governments, uh, sectoral association, professional orders, uh, invested a lot in trying to put awards in this form of corporations, in the um, public calls, and, uh, but also in assisting firms in, in uh, creating these network contracts. Sicily did not, and the results are striking. Of these 7,000 contracts, in terms of firms, the presence of Sicilian firms is much lower than uh, Puglia. One final uh, slide is the relevance of human capital, something that, of which I didn't say much. But this is uh, important because uh, uh, th this is the, the, the um, different measures of uh, entrepreneurs having a university degree in exporting firms, non-exporting firms, and potentially exporting firms. You remember that from previous slides, potentially exporting firms were good firms, very innovative, who felt that they had the power to go into foreign markets, enter new markets, conquer new markets, and find new uh, international demand for high quality and good price goods offered by Saudi. But they did not do that. Uh, because they didn't feel, uh, they didn't have, they, they had many constraints for not trying to go abroad. And one of the reasons can be the fact that the, uh, this difference in human capital, which is striking, that means also knowledge of languages, knowledge of contractual law, knowledge of, uh, of uh, digital platforms, all these things that in very micro firms, which are characteristic of the South, uh, do, cannot be found in, in these potential export entrepreneurs. And this can be an explanation of missing exports, which is one of the reasons why uh, also southern GDP is so away from uh, the rest of the country. So, in conclusion, within area inequalities are important, in uh, my opinion. They exist, are relevant, and can be useful to identify virtuous models of uh, growth and dynamism. Quality of institution is important, as we have seen in terms of cooperation, human capital. One last caveat to finish off. This is uh, perhaps a useful and necessary uh, exercise, a necessary analysis to, to learn lessons, perhaps also to reduce inequalities in the future. But uh, w this should not lead us to forget that structural factors that hinder growth and convergence are there and need to be tackled by politics by, uh, by uh, structural measures uh, that increase uh, levels of activities, that increase number of firms, that increase uh, uh, productive activity in the South. And uh, so uh, in doing this, it is certainly uh, relevant to uh, produce those public goods and services that can uh, meet this strong de demand for integration, even 
within the South, because uh, the South is very lowly integrated within itself, and this needs politics and not only virtuous uh, dynamic firms that exist and have al always existed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francesco. Um, we are happy to have um, Chiara Saraceno as a discussant uh, uh, of these uh, three presentations. Chiara Saraceno is uh, the most important Italian sociologist of the family of women and welfare, author of many, many books. Uh, she is now a fellow at uh, Carlo Alberto College, and we are lucky to have uh, her here as a visiting at the Scuola Normale Superiore, has been teaching for a long time at the University of Turin, and so she will tell us also the post-industrial <laughs> scene. Thank you for the most important sociologist. I don't think <laughs> we have a very important sociologist here. <laughs> so, okay, uh, these are, as we you can you heard, very three very interesting papers, very complex. So very, it's not easy to uh, to discuss uh, in depth all of them. But uh, I think they are also complementary to some, some degree, because uh, the, the three of them look at, the, at how the territorial dimension interacts with uh, the production and the management of inequalities, so uh, at different levels. Uh, so Keating, I start, I go in orders. So uh, I, I find, found very interesting, being a welfare scholar, let's say, myself, that while most uh, welfare studies uh, about the development and the need of change of the welfare state uh, look at, uh, uh, are involved in the debate retrenchment versus recalibration, uh, Keating addresses one very important issue, which is the changing boundaries of the, or the, um, the vanishing boundaries of the welfare state. So what he calls uh, rescaling. Uh, very few uh, welfare state scholars, Ferrer a little bit, studied that. But you, it is not a central issue of welfare state studies. While, uh, as Keating in his work and also in the paper today has clearly uh, argued, I mean, the, the issue of boundaries is becoming increasingly crucial about in, in, um, concerning what is happening to the welfare state. I would add to the uh, to the need of of, uh, of of the issue of the changing boundary migration because also migration is changing because it's changing the population of uh, uh, which uh, uh, asks for welfare, but all the other dimensions are there. So this, I think, sh uh, I want to underline, because it's not usual in welfare state studies. Um, uh, so the state boundedness of the welfare state has been put in question by endogenous and exogenous reasons, by bottom up uh, and top down reasons, because rescaling occurs both towards regions and sometimes even cities, and, 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 and this is a question mark, upward. Uh, can you say upscaling? Uh, upscaling, <laughs> upscaling, up <laughs> up upward. Uh, a small, uh, not criticism, but uh, let's say specification, uh, the local level of the welfare state has always existed. Uh, particularly, I mean, uh, it has always uh, been some kind of underestimated because most welfare state studies, particularly when they are comparative, they just study the state welfare state, the state provision, pensions, unemployment benefits, and so on and so forth. But when you look at services, then there is, but service and to some degree, degree even minimum income uh, measures, housing policies, they have all to do with 
the, uh, with the local. Then the local can be defined at the regional, the city, on whatever level. I myself, for a long time, particularly looking at Italy, have al always spoken about the mun municipal welfare state, <laughs> that, is, that we had a, a federal kind of, of welfare state, but very, very dispersed. So it's not new. What is new probably is that, uh, that uh, even central welfare state now uh, decentralize. But as you correctly say, it's a movement back and forth, which is very often uh, uh, the outcome of political dec decision rather than of particular needs which arise. At the same time, at the EU level, although what we see now is the bounding uh, the restrictive and constricti uh, constricting uh, dimension of the EU on the, uh, on the national welfare states, we should not forget that for some time the EU had also a proactive, proactive role with regard to the welfare state, particularly to the less developed welfare states. Uh, it was very clear on uh, gender, on gender issues. Uh, actually, somebody in the past said that the social dimension in, in the EU policy developed firstly around the gender, uh, gender equality issues, um, but also so between, it's mostly recommendation, but there are also directives, for instance, the, the maternity and parental leave directives and so on. So uh, it's not, also that is not totally new. Uh, if I remember correctly, when there were the negotiation with the accession countries, there was a lot, a, a great deal of negotiation about pensions, about minimum income provision, and so on and so forth. So uh, yes. It is an, an upboundedness, but it's not always been, let's say, negative. It has always it has also be, had been uh, had these pro proactive uh, roles. Uh, what uh, um, I uh, what I found very interesting, but at the same time problematic in your paper, is the discussion which to some degree get, comes back also with Colin Crouch's paper, that is this uh, 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 regionalism, uh, uh, how, how we can deal with that, how can we understand exactly how it develops. It's not a just, there is not one recipe or there is not one uh, 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 blueprint on the way this territorial Da, um, bottom up and uh, uh, or top down movement uh, uh, develop and what I, uh, it was very interesting the discussion of the contested uh, argument of the race to the bottom because actually many examples are to the contrary you you mentioned some of them uh, I can mention Spain that at least until the crisis. Uh, within its autonomy had a clear, a clear process of race to the, to the top, that is uh, around minimum income provision, around uh, family policies and so on. It was the, the, the more, uh, let's say, progressive region starting, but then the other one coming coming up, and um, actually the Scottish case that you did not, uh, that you discussed in your paper but you did not present it, is very interesting because they refrain from doing what the, what is England or UK? England. England, <laughs> what England uh, does, that is they keep their universalistic approach, their, their generous approach. So is in this case probably what there is the, the national, pro, national pride. It would be interesting to understand why, probably, you, you know, but, uh, but I think there's a very interesting case, the Scottish case, that in, in the face of what England does in terms of uh, redu reducing welfare rights and so on, they keep their, their own position. Mm? Uh, they keep, 
it has to do with identity. To some degree, it comes out that it has to do with national identity, not state, but national in this case, national identity. And also other examples in the crisis, I think, which are interesting in terms of not necessarily uh, going the way of the race to the bottom, is uh, the way Iceland and Ireland also reacted to uh, the crisis. So, for instance, it, it, which also showed that although the state has lose, lost some power of decision, even it, particularly within the EU and with, particularly within the Eurozone, the state can st still do uh, different. And still they do different. I was part of a comparative study on what happened to ch children and poverty in different European. And Ireland was a very interesting case because they tried to protect the poor. I mean, the poor became a little bit poorer, but less so because and the policies actively uh, tried to protect them more than other groups. Okay, also Crouch uh, looks, and I liked your idea of speaking of nostalgia instead of populism. That is nostalgia as, let's say, as the ground on which different kind of populism can arise uh, or, or can be used to develop different kinds of uh, po uh, populism. What I do not fully agree uh, with you is that uh, nostalgia has not always necessary to do, nostalgia li linked to populism in particular, to pop uh, with uh, <coughs> an idea of a past, uh, uh, a traditional past, masculine and so on. Uh, the, the, uh, the Danish example, and the Dutch example, they are defending their liberal, free society, uh, uh, gender equalitarian society against what they perceive as an attack from all those, exactly as they perceive, the Danish particularly, perceived as an attack from the southern European when they were <laughs> at the beginning, uh, a few years ago, uh, I remember, so that the, the Southern wanted their welfare state. Uh, now they are, they are afraid, this is particularly clear um, uh, in the uh, Dutch example, uh, a Dutch case, where they really uh, voice uh, uh, their antagonism to what they uh, they perceive as the Islamic attack on their freedom, on their liberties, on, uh, uh, on their gender equal and uh, sexually free society. So it's not only going back to the traditional gender and equal, and actually even in the more um, traditional Minded uh, populist, uh, I'm speaking both of Le Pen in France and Salvini in Italy, they use the uh, gender, equ uh, gender equality argument when they, want, when they are against migration. <laughs> So they may, might be, they might, I think that Salvini has a nostalgia for the, for the traditional family of the past. I, I agree. But when, he, has, when he, has, he develops his argument, and Le Pen the same, is a xenophobic argument, then it, there is a strong use of the gender equality argument. So it's a very mixed thing, it, it, which is a little bit complicated also when you have to address them. Um, so I agree that we need many more data to understand what happens where, and, uh, and I see that there is an agreement, I understood there is an agreement between you and, and, uh, and uh, 
cheating. <laughs> Sorry for my, my old age. <laughs> uh, but, uh, the, the, the disaggregating data uh, at the territorial level is necessary in order to understand better what goes on. I would add that it's not only an issue of having more disaggregated data based on the usual uh, dimensions, the standard social culture, cultural dimension, but also we need more detailed disaggregated data on what happened, <laughs> actual and perceived migration, for instance, which is the big issue. And could be two different things, because you can perceive migration as a danger even if it is not there, as in Hungary, but the perception about that. So, how, so I think that maybe some more uh, uh, about gender or, uh, or about the homosexuals and so on. So other data than the standard one. So um, about attitudes toward these kind of things. Also, also jumps in the, <laughs> in the local uh, data. Uh, after having shown uh, the, um, uh, the north-south divide, but uh, he really works with the, uh, with the, uh, with the local data and um, asking an interesting question, that is whether there is something, um, whether the high heterogeneity of the south can give some hint on a different development of the South. I would add to the heterogeneity you mentioned at least two others, there are many more, but two others. One is that uh, the South is also much more uh, unequal uh, economically than the North. So in the South is, much, is, more, uh, is much poorer, it is the it is the area where poverty in Italy is concent highly concentrated, but at the same time it has a, a much wider inequality in, in economic. And it's like a, an, undeveloped kind of, it, an undeveloped country from, from this point of view. And the second, uh, second heterogeneity I would mention is also <laughs> gender inequality. It would be interesting to see, to add to the, uh, to the variable that you use whether there are differences across the South in terms of uh, women's uh, labor force participation, for instance, and also in terms of economic inequality at the, uh, the intra-regional level. Um, there is something you mentioned in your paper and not in the presentation, which I think uh, uh, should be, should, it's very important, should be more, uh, thought through. That is, uh, uh, the social ties which are used in the South are not only, you say, there are more uh, occasional, uh, uh, less systematic, and so on. But you, in the paper, you say, the, no, you said it also in, in a bit in, in the presentation. There are much more strong ties. Strong ties. And uh, because there is an issue of trust, it, the, there is not only an issue of... Uh, not availability of other ties, at least this is what you say in the paper. No, not. There is a lack of trust, so you trust more those who are part of your strong network. But this, as you showed, <laughs> is really a, a handicap. Is really a handicap, because what you showed without showing the other one. So you showed having ties or, or having uh, external ties or uh, uh, how they are uh, efficacious. Strength it would be interesting to see, what? The strength of weak ties. Uh, yes, <laughs> but I mean, this is a real problem. As long as they can count only on strong ties, 
it is a different version of um, amoral families, not amoral families, is inefficient families. I never believed in amoral fa families, but inefficient families probably is, is a more correct expression. Uh, finally, I would... Uh, no, um, uh, no. A small, uh, a small comment on the role of human capital. Also in the North, uh, the human capital of entrepreneurs is very low, on average. Emilio Reineri, who is a, a sociologist of economy, uh, always tells me that I, don't know, that, I don't remember the percentage, but a very high percentage of Italian entrepreneurs do not have a university degree. So probably the same figure you, you showed for the South would be valid also in the North, in the center North, that is the, the, the enterprises who have as a head a, uh, with, a, with a, a university degree are more innovative, have, uh, are more uh, export-minded and so on and so forth. The problem is that in the South there are fewer and also they migrate. <laughs> Those with the university they migrate. And that is a problem. But the, the role of the human of the human capital I don't think is different in the in the north and in the south. Uh, and, the, and, the, and it is a common problem of the Italian economy, the low qualification of Italian uh, on average of Italian entrepreneurs. Finally, you correctly point out that the quality of institution is very important. I would, I would also wonder whether uh, also local welfare systems are different to begin with, and whether it counts with having or not a, welfare, a local welfare a bit more efficient in, a, in, in an average lower level in the south than in the north, but whether there is a, a, an added value for what I know. You, you spoke about Puglia, from what I know at least until some time ago in Puglia, they had a much more proactive welfare not only mm. than in other uh, regions. So that could also be put into your research. Thank you. Thank you, Chiara. We can open the floor now for um, comments, uh, questions, um, contributions. Who is starting? Donatella. Thank you all for very interesting um, presentations and comment. I, I wanted <coughs> to start uh, from um, Collins uh, content uh, and message which I share, it is not just the left behind. And in fact, if you see also at international level, you have these um, xenophobic responses in the countries in the north and in the center uh, of Europe, not the center east, not only the center east, but also the others which are not those which uh, were suffering most uh, from uh, being left behind. Uh, but probably we need to have a more, um, I can say, uh, complex uh, uh, explanations because maybe there are also the left behind. Uh, and since voting for a party is never just a one class issues or tend not to be, uh, I think it would be very important to also uh, look inside these uh, territories for the different social classes. And inside, we were talking this morning about varieties of populism, also which type of uh, uh, xenophobic populist parties offer which type of uh, solution. But I was also thinking about um, 
Michael's presentation that anyhow, even if it is not the left behind, there is more and more a welfareist discourse, which is connected also with what Michael was saying. Uh, it has been, uh, um, social rights have been embedded uh, in the development of the nation state, and it is not by chance that in a period of rescaling, retrenchment, or whatever, uh, of welfare state, it is a topic which is re-emerging in both, uh, let's call them inclusive ethno-nationalism, so that in Scotland, like in uh, uh, Catalonia, uh, independentism was not only claimed on uh, a cultural basis, but also very much uh, on a basis of we are those who care about social justice against the nation state which was perceived as betraying this type of values. Uh, and, and this is also true of uh, exclusive forms of uh, nationalism, including those uh, who suggest um, neoliberal type of recipes somewhere, but in other uh, aspects of their politics like Orban, propose some uh, um, welfare protection. And uh, uh, in Poland, uh, um, talk with some colleagues who say, yes, one of the strengths of the uh, xenophobic right is also that it is the only one uh, who frames uh, um, claims for welfare, even if they are made in an exclusive and xenophobic uh, uh, languages. Questions? Well, I can uh, over there, the senior. Uh, you get the microphone, one sec. Yes, maybe it's a very simple question, but I'm not. <laughs> it's just, uh, could you give an example of this rescaling of welfare policy? Just. Uh, because it's difficult from an economic point of view to understand how an entity which does not collect taxes, taxes can then um, uh, act as a welfare actor, you understand? <laughs> but maybe I'm too. <laughs> and another question for Pier Francesco Asso, uh, which is, uh, in your picture you see these microeconomic factors that could uh, uh, worsen the position of some firm in the south with respect to the north. Uh, but you, there is no reflection on why uh, in, the, in the years that you studied after the crisis, uh, the position of the South has, so, has fallen so much with respect to the past. I don't know whether micro or macroeconomic factor matters, but in any case, just an observation. More questions? Well, I, I can add just a, a, a few connection with the previous conference we had, um, both in terms of the, um, the extent of the increase of uh, inequality, both in incomes production and uh, welfare provision, uh, for instance, and how they are really central in this, uh, in determining, the, in shaping the, not in a deterministic way, but in shaping these uh, complex uh, processes. In the case of uh, Sweden, for instance, uh, the story we heard last time was that uh, the uh, reduction of redistribution through the welfare system to the middle classes, while the maintenance of redistribution to the immigrants was a crucial factor in reshaping the political views and opening a political space for the anti-immigrant party. In Latin America, we heard the story that uh, the shift to the right at the end of the social democratic wave of redistributive politics uh, was associated also to the reduced uh, room after the collapse of um, the reduction of uh, uh, raw material prices. Uh, so the state had less income to redistribute and uh, the, the redistribution continued to go to the poorest, 
uh, which maintain their uh, income, uh, real income levels, but uh, uh, the middle classes uh, lost, and the shift to the right uh, was also associated to this uh, different relative perception in terms of uh, uh, obtaining advantages from uh, redistribution policies. In the case of Italy, uh, the, ex the amount of, uh, of disparities is really unprecedented in, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the data that we showed uh, showing the level of wages So for those who have a job, and in the South we have a lot of problems with the not having jobs, but uh, in, in the last 30 years uh, the, the top uh, 10 richest wage earners increased their uh, wage levels in real terms by 22%, and the bottom 25% of wage earners, which are la largely concentrated in the South, reduced their wage level by 25%. So the gap compared to 30 years ago has increased by 50%. Uh, and clearly, the regional dimension in this context has a, uh, is relevant. And of course, the precarization of work is an important part of the story. If we take uh, uh, into account these different um, uh, types of uh, labor contracts, clearly the uh, diversity in uh, regional dynamics uh, is, uh, is again stronger. So um, all this add, um, introduces the problem of a sort of, uh, it's not just an, an issue of absolute inequality or absolute impoverishment. It, it is, it's very important the relative position, both uh, in, in the local communities where this uh, comparison is taking place, but also in, in, in terms of uh, relative winners and relative losers in, in different contexts. So maybe you can add uh, some of these uh, considerations. We can have a first round of uh, answers. So Michael, you want to start? Well, I, I just take up that, that, that last one about rescaling of, of welfare. It depends how you define welfare, but the tendency nowadays is to take a broader conception of welfare, not just cash transfers, but see it as a whole policy field that include this public services and, and indeed just about any public service has redistributive consequences. Uh, and economic development has redistributive consequences uh, as well. Taking that broader uh, conception, then there's a lot that can be done at the regional level. There is also the question of taxes because regions do have taxation powers increasingly highly constrained, but that has been the tendency. You could say it's offloading the cost to the regions if you're a cynic, which I am, of course, you know, but there's, 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 there's a lot of, of that too. And then decisions have to be made about priorities. Uh, and then if we think of redistribution, not just in the old in, interpersonal sense, but by different groups, what are the priority groups? Is the young favored here, families there, older people in, in another place? These are really quite important differences. And then, of course, the holy grail is to get those policies that are both developmental and uh, redistributive and inclusive at the same time. And that's where childcare comes in, gender equality, social inclusion, economic development, and so on. So it's not as simple as that, we know, but it's attractive because it seems to meet those things uh, at the same time. Or, or um, vocational education, vocational training that, that's done, as far as I can see, pretty badly in most European countries, and certainly in, in the UK it's done extremely badly. Uh, but, but we notice then, looking at these, particularly where you have training delivered by these uh, paritaire organizations, they call them in France, the, the, the employers and the unions together, a big field of struggle because the employers want the people who are easiest to train, yeah. and the unions want the people who are most difficult to train because they're trying to include the, uh, the unemployed. Now, that again has important redistributive consequences, but it's not welfare in, in the traditional old-fashioned old sense. Just one, one point about... Uh, oh, well, you get, you, get, you get a lot of that. In Italy, there's this 2001 constitutional reform. In, in Spain, there, there have been... All the statutes of autonomy have been reformed with the exception of the Basque one, and that's that's blocked at the moment. Uh, in, in Germany, there, were, there was more or less failed federal reform, which was trying to rescale things. In Belgium, a massive shift towards the regions and, and the communities has taken place. In the United Kingdom, uh, a very considerable devolution in three stages to Scotland, 
Wales is, is following Scotland, and in England there's this continual search for the right territorial scale. It's been going on all my life. They never managed to get it. Now it's city regions. Colin and I, who are very old men, remember city regions <laughs> back in the 1970s. It's just trying to get to that magical uh, level there. And the, the difficulty in England is partially it's seen as politicized. It's all about management. There's no political to it. So I'm taking welfare in that very, very broad sense and linking it to institutional change and changes in the representation of different social interests. I, I just want to acknowledge a point that Chiara made about migration, which is really, really important. And I've been trying to think of a way to get migration into that story because it, it, it is absolutely vital. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's, that, that happens, yeah, yeah. And w whether you call it a law or not is, is really unimportant. Mm. It's a formal distinction. Uh, but, but, but policies, uh, yes, eligibility mm -hmm. is determined very often by regional regulations to, to certain kinds of, of services, the availability of services, the availability of, of, of particular kinds of services, whether they're services in kind or whether they're services uh, in Cash. Now, what it would be interesting to do, and I'd like to do again, if I ever get the opportunity to do it, was, was, was trace that and document that, uh, see exactly what the differences are and what the consequences of those differences are. Certainly, we know there is a big variation now, and a lot of it is not at the national level, it's at the regional level, and the local level as well. That's, that's and this totally independently of fiscal stance and other things. No, it's not. It's, it's totally... Okay. The, the, the fiscal situation is, is part of the framework for that, the extent to which, and, and the paradox of fiscal decentralization is it can weaken regions if it exposes them too much to the market, but it can strengthen them if it's within the context of some kind of interregional solidarity. Thank you. Chiara made a really important point about the position of Islam in all of this. Um, if there is one movement that really demonstrates in an extreme degree a combination of nostalgia for a lost past, extreme masculinism, uh, not racism, but religious intolerance and strong stress on religious orthodoxy, it is the Islamist Islamist movements. I don't mean all Muslim people, but the Islamist movements, they're the most extreme example of all the things I was talking about. The um, most extreme form of nostalgia is the uh, belief that they could re-establish the caliphate. It's almost as unrealistic as the current attempt to reconstruct the British Empire. Um, but uh, so that does raise very, very interesting issues. As I was saying in Donatella's seminar this morning, the the nationalist international is a rather incoherent thing because they can hate each other, um, although they've got similar ideas. And how p people in different parts of the West relate to Islamist movements is very interesting. I mean, today we needn't discuss policy possibilities. We can simply notice it as adding further to what Donatella and I uh, talk about as the different kinds of left behind, right? Now, you may well find it's your Dutch liberalism that's being left behind by the rise of Islam. And that, that's, people, have a, you know, people are going to react in that way. But just a few comments on these issues, which, which they, they come into my paper a bit, but they're mainly to do with the, um, the discussion of the Italian South. And, the, and that is this question of, of it, the role of education, in, because education is fundamental in sustaining local economies and also in, in, in wider, in, in, in sustaining local cultures. And, uh, and, and Sicily, for years, has produced talented people for the rest of Italy, several of whom are in this room at the moment. Um, uh, actually, in, in the south of Italy, there's a tendency often, certainly Carlo and I found, oh, he's, Carlo's just gone, uh, Carlo Trigilli and I found some years ago that actually it's a higher number of young people often uh, go, taking higher education in southern Italy than in the center, possibly also in the northeast. Um, 
because they're all trying to get jobs in the public administration. They're all getting law degrees and applying in these concorsi for jobs in the bureaucracy, and very few of them are getting them. Meanwhile, in central Italy, uh, young people would go to university. Then at a certain point, uncle will say, come on, there's a job for you now in the firm. Stop all that studying. Uh, come and join the local business, which meant the small firms were never really getting the benefit of highly educated people. Uh, and so that there is a problem of the sustainability of the Italian small firm model if it, it, it can't uh, begin to embrace uh, the need for higher levels of education. And um, this is going to be found in, in several countries as well. Uh, I remember interviewing for the OECD some entrepreneurs in Treviso. They were very successful, actually, and they were, they, they were coping with change. And they were building links with Chinese partners. They were doing all the right things. They said to us, we all learned our skills as Gastarbeiter in Germany. That's where we got our training, in German firms. We then came back and we brought it back here. We wouldn't get those skills here. And none of our children are going to work in these firms. They all want to be lawyers. So there's a problem of reproducibility of, of some of these, uh, these economic models. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you, uh, Professor Saraceno, for your comments. Um, well, I would just like to say that uh, I think that the south of Italy, in the southern economy, is living in a kind of a middle income trap. Mm -hmm. That means that uh, it is, and this is quite a new fact, say 20, 21st century fact, when it, this means that it is hard for the southern economy to advance towards the top and create uh, high human capital intensive activities in the urban areas. And it is hard, on the other hand, to fight competition from, say, the east, mm -hmm. near east or far east. And, uh, and, uh, and Europe, in the sense, is looking very much towards east rather than towards south, and the south is kind of uh, marginalized. This has brought uh, a, a, an, an immense reduction of productive activity in the last 10, 15 years. So-called premature deindustrialization, as Daniel Roderick would put it, for instance, without substituting this collapse of uh, productive activity with uh, new activities related to services, to uh, other, other activities. So this is uh, one of the things that uh, is influencing this uh, uh, widening inequalities. Then it is true that income inequalities uh, in the South uh, uh, it is, is more uh, dispersed. There are big riches and there are huge masses and the, 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 there is a small part of the paper that deals with this as no part of my presentation, but the, there is this uh, big divide in terms of uh, income inequality. And, uh, the, the, but one thing that I, I would like to add is that uh, if you try to destructuralize GDP gaps, uh, you see that uh, the difference between the southern regions and uh, the rest of the country does not depend much on lower productivity. So th there is lower productivity in the south compared to the north, but not as much as that would explain the, the GDP gaps. And this is quite uncommon, unusual. In, in other countries, when there are regional inequalities, the lower regions are, uh, the, 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 the regional inequalities depend on the fact that lower regions are, have lower productivity. In the south, it depends both on lower productivity and quite as much on absence of work, on uh, the labor market, on missing jobs. And uh, and uh, gender inequalities, you mentioned that there are 
uh, huge discrepancies from this point of view from between the South and the rest of the, co uh, the country in terms of uh, the female participation in labor markets. But in the 70s, uh, participation rates, as far as males were concerned, were very much the same between the South and the North. Now, you have the North with how participation rates in male and female participation rates in the North are slightly higher than male participation rates in the South and female participation rates in the South are very low. Of course, there is the black market, which in the South is more extensive and in some case, in some sense can explain some social resilience that occurred even during the crisis. But then this is just another part of the story, it creates all sorts of distortions, both in social relations and economic activity. Uh, in terms of entrepreneurs' education, yes, you are right. But the, uh, nevertheless, there is, a, there is a recent report by Istat on, uh, on, uh, on uh, a recent report on knowledge, and it shows that still the gap exists between the South and the North and that 40% of uh, the entrepreneurs in the South that were uh, in, uh, interviewed in this, in this ISTAT report had a junior high school degree in the South, 40%. And uh, m most of the, of the entrepreneurs had less than 10 years of school in the South. In the North, figures are higher, and in the North, figures are much higher uh, regarding human resources in science and technology. And uh, Sicily and Puglia are very low in this respect. Um, one final uh, thing on, about the lack of trust. Uh, yes, um, in fact, many uh, cooperation agreements uh, uh, were not made in the South during the crisis because of lack of trust. But on the other hand, uh, th there is a, 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 an active part of Southern society made w w by informal institutions, made by uh, Chamber of Commerce's organizing fairs, business to business, uh, making together customers and, and uh, buyers. And it is through these channels that um, most of uh, Sicilian firms uh, and southern firms manage to uh, go abroad and find an entrance into foreign markets. And once broken the barriers, they manage at that point to generate new innovations, new investments, and uh, being able to increase their exports year after year. So, the, the, there is a lack of trust, but there is also the, the activity of many informal institutions that have been uh, helpful in doing this. Uh, about P Professor Tropeano's question on the um, macroeconomic factors uh, that uh, produced such an impact on the South, well, um, well, this is, uh, this is a, a big question that uh, it depends also on the, on the, um, on the um, events that characterize the, the new century. Uh, foreign investments in the South are negligible. Uh, public investments in the South were very much reduced. Uh, also, I mean, this is a long history that, uh, from my point of view of economic historians, needs to be written and will be written, the, the history of European funds. But uh, the, the most, so, uh, most of, the, of, the, um, of the European funds that were channeled in the South with uh, different results according to also the, 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 the functioning of the local politics, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, did not add much to the public expenditure in the South. And public expenditure collapsed between 2000 and nowadays uh, in nominal terms. Uh, so it was uh, from a macroeconomic 
point, it was a shock that is reflected by a sharp reduction of, uh, of uh, investment capacity that occurred in the South since 2000. Thank you, Francisco. Your round of questions, Laszlo. Thank you. Uh, I have a question, Michael, uh, to you. One is, uh, uh, what happened to uh, the EU's, the different EU policies that uh, try to reduce territorial, territorial disparities? Because uh, in the last two decades of uh, the last century, the EU invested a lot, at least in Eastern Europe, but I think also in, in uh, uh, the South on uh, uh, empowering regions, on uh, 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 creating conditions of uh, development, uh, uh, endogenous growth capacities, uh, 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 different uh, 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 assistance programs that try to uh, increase the capacities of uh, local and regional governments to create developmental alliances, so things like that. There were lots of such investment. And then, uh, in the first, first of all, after 2008, I saw uh, nearly a situation that went in the opposite direction. That uh, uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, the, the countries that were, for example, in crisis, in, uh, were hit by crisis in 2008, uh, they were allowed to centralize, recentralize, renationalize uh, all the development funds, do whatever it uh, uh, pleased them, just to spend money and take away uh, uh, resources from reducing uh, territorial disparities. Uh, in Donatella's paper, I remember she uh, mentions, for example, the EU uh, even. Uh, urging uh, uh, even the federal state, like Spain, uh, to recentralize uh, uh, as a result of this monetarization uh, uh, and dominance of, of monetary uh, perspectives uh, uh, in the EU. So I, I wonder what happened, uh, how you see that. Uh, Pierre Francesco, I have a question that you mentioned now in your reply, this uh, expression of middle income trap. Uh, from the literature of middle income trap, what I would get is that uh, while the relations among the firms are relevant, and so trust and other things, at least as important, if not more important, are relations between firms uh, and research institutes and universities uh, and self-governments uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, institutions uh, that uh, might uh, improve the coming about, the chances of coming about of developmental alliances. Usually innovation, uh, uh, not just at the level of firms, but innovation in the level of cooperation among different local actors uh, uh, makes the difference uh, from moving out from the uh, middle income trap or not. Uh, so I wonder whether you uh, have uh, anything on that. Yes, I have uh, one question for Michael and one for Colin. For Michael, uh, listening to your answer to, <laughs> to the first question, uh, I wonder, would you say that rescaling res both downward and upward, but particularly downward, uh, is also caused by an increasing differentiation and complexity of uh, ways of redistribution? So you mentioned that I, not only there, are, there is the traditional welfare state that already was not only monetary redistribution, but was service in kind redistribution and that is more local than national, at least at the implementation and level. But now there are many different ways helping the the low skilled to get skilled through some 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 agreement with enterprises or uh, so, so there are many many different ways. and that cannot be done at the national level the national level can just provide frameworks uh, maybe some kind of resources, standards, or whatever, but then it has to do with the local market, the local uh, um, actors, and so on and so forth. We see it, that it's particularly in all, even the most centralized minimum income provisions, 
when, when they are accompanied by some activation or whatever policies, they have to rely with the local actors, and that can produce quite different outcomes because of the heterogeneity of the local actor. But that can happen on them. To call in, you say, and I agree with also Donatella, that is not only an issue of being left behind. But then I wonder, taking seriously your nostalgia <laughs> concept, can be that together with those who are left behind, there are those who perceive, for some reason, a threat to their way of living. So maybe winners, <laughs> but they, the Danish and the Dutch perceive that they are threatened by the imagined Muslims, <laughs> not only by the real Muslim, but they imagine, but also by mi migrants, by those who are culturally heterogeneous, could be also European, uh, no, by culturally heterogeneous, not uh, uh, similar. So maybe the, the concept of threat, of being, of feeling threatened, thre threatened uh, by some external Actor. That could be uh, to get help to go, get away from only focusing on those who are left behind. Yeah. And the stagia, our, our way of living, or our identity, our, as, as what makes us Dutch, or, or what we have become as Dutch. Hi, I, uh, I have a question for um, uh, Colin. And, um, Mainly uh, connecting more to the idea of uh, regions as being politicized and not being the uh, sort of effect uh, of something that is before we came there or some ideas happened. Uh, so regions being constructed. Uh, maybe uh, it's not more of a question, maybe even a suggestion. Maybe uh, in your research you should take the approach of not looking at regional statistics, but actually going interviewing the individuals and then looking from what their replies are and also uh, then maybe plotting it on a map and look how regions uh, can, can, can look uh, based on this uh, study and maybe draw new regions and new borders in this term. Thank you. I have a question um, to Professor Crouch. Um, I like also the idea of nostalgia, um, but I was wondering um, I think that we sh should uh, be cautious in terms that we might be conflating uh, cultural attitudes and political behavior or political preferences. We tend to assume that there is symmetry and, and perfect correspondence between those, no? but it might not be the case, and actually it's not the case. Um, and another thing that I think that we should be cautious is the fact that even if I agree with you in the fact that it seems to be that the territorial dimension of politics uh, is relevant. Is relevant. Um, we might be uh, falling into the uh, um, error of ecological fallacy, right? I mean, for example, you can also um, you might rem remember the map of Brazil after the uh, last uh, presidential election, and you can see that the North voted for for uh, and against Bolsonaro and the South uh, supported Bolsonaro. And they say, okay, so the poor, um, the poor living in the North, um, because the North there is the poorest uh, area of the country, the poor supported uh, the left-wing candidate. But that doesn't mean necessarily that all the poor supported that candidate, or that there is no poor that voted for Bolsonaro, or that all the poor in the South voted for Bolsonaro. So we might be here um, uh, making um, uh, a, a huge mistake of interpretation if we don't uh, take that into consideration. So again, the question is, which one or what is the right scale here to consider? In some countries or in some context, the territorial scale or the territorial dimension might be determinant uh, to understand differences and things, but in other cases, it might be the social scale. I mean, it's the territory in which I live or the group to which I belonged the class, 
uh, the uh, ethnic group, whether or not I am migrant, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, and I think that this is an empirical question. It's not, it's not a question that we can answer, you know, uh, with, with a taking for granted uh, theory. Um, I also like the, the idea of nostalgia, and probably because I am affected by nostalgia. I am affected by nostalgia in the sense of thinking about a solution to the current state of inequalities and territorial inequalities. I wish that it was enough to think about education and the welfare state, like it was in the past, but I think it's not. And I think one of the reasons it's not is because we give for granted that those that have wealth and power, we relinquish this power automatically, and they don't. So if we keep looking down at how people feel threatened, which is important, uh, by rising inequality, migration, and so on and so on, we are missing a big piece of the puzzle, which is elite. And our elite influence, actually, power and the state and redistribution. Um, so I think we also need to look at, at the role of organized interest in actually shaping all of these dynamics. Uh, I was just reading, for instance, today a paper about the Swiss referendum on inheritance taxes that showed the business power was behind campaigns that shifted the vote against the tax. So I think we also need to look at it. Uh, hello, thank you for your uh, talks. My question is um, uh, uh, regards the institutional arrangements. Uh, I, it seems to me from the from the discussion that uh, it emerged that uh, a complex of factors are affecting uh, equalities and inequalities at the territorial level. Um, mm, so uh, political factors, uh, the Puglia examples seems to, to show that, uh, economic factors, cultural factors, and uh, I was wondering how much institutional factors are uh, also uh, influencing uh, inequalities. Um, in particular, uh, Italy, I think, uh, could be um, an interesting uh, empirical case because uh, since 2001, the reform of the constitutions assigned to the regions uh, very important powers that they didn't have before, and it's the power to deliver some type of services, in particular the health, which uh, was national and now it's regional. Uh, uh, health, the public health system is still public, but it's, it has been regionalized. Does this uh, type of uh, intervention or institutional uh, transformation affect the way in which the citizens receive some services? And if uh, the answer is yes, how? In a better way or in a worse way? I don't know. Uh, I, I have no data and uh, I have no answer. <laughs> Maybe some of you have some. <laughs> Thank you. I was thinking also about nostalgia in, uh, in the same line of Chiara, Cesar uh, and Rossella. Uh, and it is it's an interesting idea, but maybe we should go empirically more in-depth in that because uh, there is a nostalgia in Polanyi's type of approaches, so, uh, which has been also present in the labor movement and we, which has not automatically produced uh, exclusive or conservative type of responses. And then I was thinking about um, uh, Ishman uh, uh, work on uh, uh, reactionary uh, and I think in that case what he says is uh, uh, describing this uh, idea of um, perversity, futility and jeopardy thesis of the reactionary discourse uh, could be combined with some specific ideas of nostalgia. But also the point is, uh, in this reaction, there is not only a reaction saying, uh, uh, let's go back to the past, but also a reaction like, uh, let's preserve what we have now. So let's uh, protect ourselves. And I think this uh, uh, could be different type of discourse, which can converge sometimes. But nostalgia alone maybe needs some uh, uh, objective to explain uh, uh, that exclusive type of response.
the speakers who you know, reply to all this very long list of questions. Well, what's the one about institutional arrangements? Yes, yes, they do make a big difference. They, they create possibilities of doing things by competences, but at, at the same time, they, they create new sets of relationships, institutional relationships. They also create new ways of framing problems themselves that look different at different territorial scales. So it's not just within spheres of functionally defined spheres, but the, the inter functional relationships, that, that would be the hypothesis about deep uh, divergence, that, that you can even define the problems differently, and occasionally we find that, occasionally, it's very, very difficult. So yes, that affects the way that citizens receive services, and we'd like to know more about that. Is it better or is it worse? That's a question I deliberately don't answer. Now, we did have a project we presented to the British ESRC, they had a public services program about 10 or 15 years ago. And we said, let's use the UK as a laboratory to see England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland. These different models, they're different. Why are they different? They wanted us to say which was best so they could all adopt the best one and all become exactly the same. So there would be no diversity. And we said, well, maybe this is a response to local conditions and local things and so on. You know, there's no, there's no one best. It's all uh, highly contextual. Um, that really gets me on to Chiara's point about differentiation. Precisely, yes. It is differentiation, complexities, uh, and, and the institutions adapt to this. It's not caused by that, but, but it's, it's one of the drivers of that, the increasing social complexity and therefore the search for different ways of aggregating problems, defining problems, and distributing uh, public goods in, in various ways. There's an interesting methodological problem that arises from that. This is how on earth do you measure that? Because what we're saying is con context matters. And you can't then construe that as a, just a series of contextless variables. You just can't do it. But nor do you want a series of just descriptive case studies. That's the trick, and that's what we're trying to do. How can we get some analytical purchase while introducing uh, context? I'm not claiming that I've got there yet, but I'm aware of the challenge of that. And then Laszlo about European policies. Yes, there was a point in the 1980s when the states seemed to be wanting to upload these issues of territorial management to the European level and the European Commission was very excited about getting this new policy instrument uh, and I published the first book about the Europe of the Regions in 1985, it was 1983 it was written uh, and then everybody took off. I don't know how many PhD theses are the children of this original project. And my, and my colleague, Barry Jones, went around telling people, don't get too excited about it. <laughs> this is not creating a the Europe. And there's a difference between a policy instrument, which is integrative, and the politics of autonomy. They're completely different. They have nothing whatever to do with each other. Um, but then this became a wonderful thing for regional politicians all of whom could go around claiming that all this manna had descended upon their region entirely by their own efforts. And we know how the distribution works. You can't do it as a local politician. But if you see how many regional capitals have direct flights to Brussels, <laughs> they, they all come back, and how many regional offices were set up in Brussels, so that people could claim credit for things that were happening already. So it's not surprising. This is how politics works. Uh, then the policy became loaded with multiple objectives. And read any of the commission documents, and I, it's a couple of years ago I read the last lot, it's not about social policy, it's not compensation, it's hard no economic development. Is it hell? I mean, it's about compensation. It's about intergovernmental compensation as well. And because the EU does not have a capacity to spend in social areas significantly, except for the social fund, which is about labor market training, this, is, this is serves as a proxy for the European social dimension. So that's loaded onto it at the same time. So you have these multiple objectives. And then you have changing paradigms. Uh, and we had this uh, uh, report, the, the Barker report, just a, a few years ago, saying, let's go back to place-based development. That's where I came in, in the 19, early 1970s, <laughs> when I was doing my PhD thesis. Uh, this is, so, so these things go round and round and round and, and, and come back again because they're intractical problems. They're wicked, wicked issues. Uh, and the commission then picks up whatever is in fashion and says that's what you should be doing. So it becomes uh, extremely 
confusing. I think the value of these European programs is mainly in policy learning. I think that's, the, the money is less important than the transmission of, 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 of good practice, and that really has been important. Yes, centralization and decentralization, and I was there, I followed this saga. The Central and Eastern European countries said, let's have regions, because that makes us like, like Europeans. You know, all Europeans have regions, preferably 16, because that's what the Germans have. Therefore, we'll have 16 regions in Poland. That is not what they're telling you. That is completely misconceived. Uh, and then I went to interview somebody in, 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 the, in the commission. He was a, a French INAC, you know, we, we, who are absolutely certain. And even when they change their mind, they're still just as certain as they were that the new thing is the truth. And he said, absolutely, you know, we said decentralize. And then we came back. We can't decentralize, you know, the local politicians, corruption. So we told them to re-centralize. We just changed our minds overnight. This confusing message came through. We might more PhDs with ECs were being, <laughs> being written, and I supervised most of them and uh, examined the others. You know, just, it became an, an industry, this Europe of, of, of the regions. And, and it came to a peak at the time of the Convention on the Future uh, of Europe. And I, I was an advisor to the Committee of the Regions. I'm not boasting, because I can say that nothing I said had any influence on the Committee of the Regions, and nothing the Committee of the Regions said had any influence on the Convention. Now, you can see it was just a totally marginal issue, and since then the whole issue has been uh, going down. And Anwin published an issue of a journal a few years ago that I contributed, whatever happened to the uh, Europe of, of the Regions. I, I think that needs to be seriously rethought. I'm, I'm not convinced that those funds are being put to a good purpose. For other kinds of, of purposes in a more fruitful way. But there's so many vested interests now around those that it's very difficult to shift those, those, those resources. Thank you. Um, yes, I'm, uh, uh, Chiara makes a good point about threat of cultural heterogeneity, which is partly people feel we have this settled way of life, this is now being threatened. Um, and, but this is a very dynamic process because over time, what we see as being our traditional way of life changes. Uh, and this is why we usually find the least problem with immigrant communities, where there are lots of them and they've been there a long time, because they have themselves assimilated into the host culture, but they've also given something to the host culture. <coughs> uh, I think I, another meeting here several months ago, I quoted the old English football song. It's not been used for a while, but we are all uh, English supporters, and, and we all eat vindaloo. Now, vindaloo is an Indian curry. The importance of it is that it rhymes with 442, which was the formation of English football teams at that time. But the, the idea was that an, English, an Indian curry, a particularly strong curry, had become symbolic of English football fans' eating habits. Showed what can happen when uh, an immigrant community has been around a long while. It, it, it gives something to the local way of life. And so, yeah, eventually you can be nostalgic for a day when we had lots of Indian restaurants. It's certainly true at the moment in Britain that there is far more resentment when a Polish shop appears in a street than when an Indian restaurant does, because British people are used to Indian restaurants. But suddenly seeing something called Polska Sklep in the street, what's this? Why are they selling these strange foods? That's not curry, that's some strange gherkin. Um, so, the, uh, and we find therefore that uh, the most intolerant attitudes towards immigrants come either from places where there aren't any, uh, which is the case of a, a lot of what's happening in Eastern Germany at the moment, or where they've arrived very recently uh, in large numbers. And this is why the waves of, not immigrants really, but refugees coming from the Middle East and North Africa has been such a shock to, the, to systems around Europe and elsewhere, because this is large numbers of, of, of people from cultures we're not used to yet. Um, and, and so I think there is a, it's also problematic is, is seasonal immigration. 
Um, it, it's very interesting. If you look at the, the vote for Brexit in Britain, there's a very large, strong support for Brexit right down the east coast, the, the coastal side of the country, stretching from the middle down to the south. And this is these areas of very strongly agricultural still, our last bit of agriculture, where there's very, very large use of seasonal labor from Poland, Lithuania, Romania, uh, Latvia. Uh, and these people come over for a few weeks, they, they either sow the crop or they pick the crop, depending on time of year, then they go back home again. And it, it works for them because they earn enough uh, working as seasonal laborers in Britain to live a decent life the rest of the year. And that's why they won't be replaced by British workers uh, when they go, because you can't, as a British worker, you can't just work for a few months in the year and then go home. You, you... So the system works very well, but these immigrant workers don't integrate very much. They, 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 they are only here for a while, and so resentment against them has been very strong. Uh, and, so it, uh, and yet at the moment, one of the proposals as to how to ease the burden of immigration after we've left the European Union, but we still need to get the Romanians and the Poles to come and pick our, our cabbages, we'll, oh, we'll just have them as seasonal labor. They won't be allowed to do anything else. That'll just make it all much worse because there, there won't be integration. So yeah, the cultural heterogeneity is fascinating because over time, uh, we all, our, our cultural traditions are absorbed and, and, and move on. Uh, we see it especially in food uh, and music, actually, in popular music, where you see uh, the, 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 what you need, you need immigrants to be there for a long time, which after a while is fine, but it's early on it's very difficult to do that. Now, there were other questions about the, yeah, the constructed nature of regions. The two of you were both... Yes, I, I, only, I, I said at the beginning I didn't like using regions. It was, uh, to make a few brief points, I, I used them because that's the level at which the political and the economic data could come together. But no, we, it, there is an enormous ecological fallacy there. We need to go back either to individual data or, very lo or existing very local data and construct up from there where actually are the levels of political and economic geography that are important? Because we don't know in advance. It's, a, it's an empirical task, uh, and it has to be built up. Um, and, and we will, if we can get these data and start doing that, we will learn very interesting things. I mean, we already know some things about big cities being smaller, uh, having different approaches to, the, to small cities. There, there's some learning there already, but we, we, there's lots we don't know yet that we could learn if we could do this more micro construction of data. Also, yes, I also agree with you that my notion of a nostalgia does conflate different issues. Uh, and different individuals may well be located differently. And you cannot assume because someone has one position, they also have another. And I, I just give the, I often give the example here of our Prime Minister, Theresa May, who is someone who clearly has enormous difficulty accepting the idea of multiculturalism. She, she really does not like immigrants. Uh, and when, uh, in all the ministries she's had, she's made life really hard for immigrants. But she is a serious feminist. She's not a woman who's been successful. She is a fe an ideological feminist. And she finds no contradiction in those two positions. Uh, and, and, so, and people can do that. What's interesting, though, is when you get political movements, they, of course, do somehow include all the things in it. Uh, and, and, or, or people who are attracted by a movement, they may think it represents all these things. So the, 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 you get this, a general air, a general atmosphere around a political movement that it, it's, it's capturing different kinds of nostalgia, then it, it can help that movement develop, although individuals have freedom to pick and choose where they stand within it. Um, and that, uh, Continuing on the nostalgia theme, that Donatella, the, the important issue is whether nostalgia is combined with pessimism or not. Um, because if it's combined with pessimism, then I think it leads to a narrow, a narrowing of attitudes. One that says things are bad. We regret the f the passing of time. It, it's not going to get any better then you get into very dark political places. 
Um, but you can, you can say, well, what a pity, that's all gone. What are we going to do now? Uh, now, see, my, my little book, Post Democracy, has been rightly accused of being nostalgic, for, and like all nostalgia, for a past that's, that's probably not really true anyway, right? Now, but I didn't end up by saying, oh, it's all bad, everything's going wrong, we better just hang on to what we've got left and fight off all change. No, I, I started looking around, where would be the points for a reconstruction of democracy, given we're here? What, what, you have to look forward to what might be new and what might help. Uh, and that, that is, that, so it's, I need to attach the adjective pessimistic to nostalgia. Actually, I was coming in the, came here from, uh, it's very difficult to get from Perugia to anywhere, and I was coming from Perugia by train, so I had three hours <laughs> in which to write a chapter, and <laughs> I was writing about this issue, and I decided at one point, somewhere around, uh, Castel Fiorentino, uh, Castellian Fiorentino, to, to put the adjective pessimistic before nostalgia when I was using it. So. Um, your point about business interests, yeah, obviously they, they've been, they, they stand outside all of this stuff, of course, but um, yes, they are very important in shaping uh, economic geography. Uh, you, you talked about organised interests. I think one of the one of the disadvantages of the recent development of economic ideologies is actually the decline of organized interests. And instead what one has is the role of the individual giant firm which lobbies for its own interests. It's, it's quite likely to get involved in corruption because it, it, it develops close relationships with politicians for its own interests. At least when business interests are organized, especially if it's a, a, across different sectors, they at least develop a kind of collective interest of business. Uh, and so they, they might not uh, have such a negative effect on, on economic development. So I think the di decline of organized business is, is actually one of the problems neoliberalism has has given us. It depends on the yes, it has completely yes, yes. Yes, just one uh, brief reply to your question on. Uh, uh, in our research, we did try to investigate the role of uh, of uh, research institutes of universities and the connection between. Uh, the, the creation of ideas and uh, the production of uh, market innovations. And we found that connections are quite weak. There are examples, there are areas where, <clears throat> particularly in Catania, Naples and Bari, where uh, actually results were, were achieved in this respect. But connections are weak and when they were achieved, politics and society were the channels through which the formal knowledge was transferred to firms. But nevertheless, uh, most of the innovations with which we uh, found in the firms that we've analyzed were socially constructed and were related to sectors like agriculture, agro-industry, uh, with which you know it, it is not enough to, uh, to 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 create urban areas with a high density of uh, of uh, high human capital activities. Uh, the, the the widest gap is there. I mean, if you measure GDP gaps, you have 70 percent, 60 percent. But if you measure the value added produced in market services in urban areas and you take Palermo or Naples or Bari, and then you take any city in Lombardia, Veneto or Emilia, the gap is that, that the, the southern cities account for 10% of what they produced in, uh, in, the other, in the other regions. So this is, uh, this is an incredible difference, and um, you know, it, it is also something that should be, should be changed in order to move uh, the southern the southern regions from that position to a higher position
thank everyone for the patience, the interest, and the intense discussion we have had. Uh, tomorrow we have uh, an even more intense, uh, longer, and uh, interesting uh, set of uh, presentation and debates. Thank you very much. We start 9.30 tomorrow morning. Thank you. So, I mean, yes, I mean...